Thank you for joining us for this regular board meeting of the Board of Trustees for Santa Clara Unified School District. It is Thursday, November 9th, 2023 at 5.05 5 o'clock and I am calling this meeting to order. We will start with a roll call of attendance. Trustee Canova, Trustee Gonzalez, absent. Trustee Lieberman? Here. Trustee Muirhead? Here. Trustee Ratterman? Here. Trustee Ryan? Here. I am here. Student Trustee Valdez? Here. Thank you so much. We have six trustees here, and uh, uh, in addition, we have our student trustee also here. We will now have our uh, introduction of the interpreter. Good evening, board. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Verónica Adams. Angélica Benítez y yo seremos las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida por el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprime el botón que dice interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de español. En este menú también puede seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio original en inglés. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now be led in our Pledge of Allegiance by Trustee Ratterman. We stand and show respect as appropriate. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Thank you. Student Trustee Valdez will now read our district mission and vision statements. Thank you. The mission of Santa Clara Unified School District is to provide equitable, engaging, and innovative educational experiences so that each student thrives in a global society. Graduates of Santa Clara Unified School District are resilient, future ready, lifelong learners who think critically, solve problems collaboratively, and are prepared to thrive in a global society. Thank you so much. We will now review and accept our agenda as appropriate. Um, one of the things that we will be doing with our agenda tonight, and this actually doesn't require a board vote, but one of the consent items, H20, um, involves myself and my child. Um, it's the field trip to, for the Cabrillo Band to go to Disneyland. So I will we will be taking a vote on that separately, which will be led by Trustee Canova. But that's just a, in a, ahead of what's going on. Are Move there to approve the agenda? Second, Rotterman. We have a motion and a second. Any other changes? Okay. All and we everything will be a roll call vote tonight. So Trustee Canova, Trustee Gonzalez, Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Muirhead. Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. I vote yes. Student Trustee Valdez? Yes. So that passes seven to zero with Student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. I will now read our guidelines and policy for public comment at board meetings. The Board of Trustees has a policy on civility. Policy 1310.1 on civility states, this policy promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among district employees, parents, and the public. This policy is not intended to deprive any person of his or her right to freedom of expression, but only to maintain to the extent possible and reasonable a safe harassment-free workplace for our students and staff. In the interest of presenting district employees as positive role models to the children of this district, as well as the community, SCUSD encourages positive communication and discourages volatile, hostile, or aggressive actions. This district seeks the public's cooperation with this endeavor. I've received no slips for public comment on closed session agenda items. Is there anyone in the room that would like to speak? Is there anyone on the Zoom with hands raised? No. So we will now go into closed session. In closed sessions, we will discuss item B.1, public employee discipline dismissal release. B2, conference with legal co counsel, existing litigation, potential claims seeking to resolve dispute concerning special education placement and services. B3, public education, public employee appointment, vice principal Santa Clara. 
B4, Conference with Labor Negotiators, Agency Representatives Gary Waddell, Jose Gonzalez, and Mark Schill, Employee Organizations, UTSC, CSEA, AFT, and Unrep Unrepresentative unrepresented employees and management. B5, conference with real property negoci negotiator about the Martinson property, agency negotiator Gary Waddell, Mark Scheel, negotiating party Martinson Child Development Center. We anticipate being in closed session for about 60 minutes. We hope to return around six o'clock.
Good evening. This is Andrew Chandra, Wilson's Tuesday, Thursday.
The board has returned from closed session and we are resuming open session. We will start with the introduction of the interpreter. Interpretación en español al www.santaclarausd.org. Haga clic en interpretación en español. Click on interpret it and select Spanish. Thank you so much. Is our interpreter online? We, we will not be starting until she's able to interpret. Will you please let us know when she's able to interpret? We have no interpreter online.
Is the video started? Thank you. We apologize for the delay. It's very important for us to provide translation. We will now have our introduction by an, our interpreter. De la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida por el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprime el botón que dice Interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de español. En este menú también puede seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio original en inglés. Thank you. Thank you. I will now read out our report out from closed session. For item B1, the board received information. For item B2, the board voted six to zero with trustee Lieber being absent, Lieberman being absent to approve an extension of the settlement agreement uh, with the parents of students 120822X2 who asserted special education claims against the district. The board approved reimbursement for certain private placement program costs not to exceed a total of 17,500 in exchange for releases and waivers of claims against the district. Trustee Canova voted yes. Trustee Fairchild voted yes. Trustee Gonzalez voted yes. Trustee Muirhead voted yes. Trustee Ratterman voted yes. Trustee Vi Ryan voted yes. Trustee Lieberman was absent. For item B3, the board received information. For item B4, the board received information. For item B5, the board received information and gave direction. We will now move on to item D1, the report from our superintendent. Thank you, President Fairchild. Uh, good evening. Uh, there's been a very busy week. Uh, I had a great start to the week visiting Westwood on Monday. Uh, it was a wonderful visit and I was so impressed with the caliber of instruction at the school and it was great to hear the targeted work that the school is doing to focus support around English learners. So it was a great way to start the week. Um, there have been a flurry of activities across the district, fall festivals and open houses and other events and just want to extend a huge thanks to the school teams and parent communities for their support in creating these special opportunities for our young people. We continue our commitment to partnership through our labor management initiative and appreciate the, our partnership with UTSC, CSEA, and CSFT. We are looking forward to continuing to support site leadership teams and, and planning for our December district leadership and learning team. Um, Let's see. Uh, it's been heartening lately to see how involved our students are in committees and teams and other groups across the district. We really value student voice in the district and ensuring that students have a say in the things that we are deciding for them. Just this week, I had the opportunity to welcome the district advisory committee uh, for their first meeting that will give critical input into our local control accountability plan and was pleased to see a wide range of community members, parents, staff, and students involved. Our district advisory committee uh, really helps us to guide our local control accountability plan, which is really a document that helps us tell the story of the district and our priorities and bringing multiple voices to the table to chart that course. We had a very productive literacy work group last week with data review and analysis uh, an analysis of elementary literacy practice survey results and analysis of some seminal research. I want to thank Assistant Superintendent Knavel and Facilitator Lori Musso and the entire planning team for their work. We're really excited to continue this work and see where it will lead us. And lastly, I want to share that our kindness campaign has kicked off. World Kindness Day is Monday, and that's also our formal launch for our campaign. We've challenged our students, our staff, our community to join us in committing and logging on our website, 1 million acts of kindness. It's a big target, but I know we can do it. Uh, we know that we can transform our schools and communities through kindness and are excited to see that ticker rise. You can check out, learn more and find resources at scusd.net slash kindness and tag us at hashtag scusdkind. And let's see what's possible when we target 
uh, blank at SCUSD with kindness. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Waddell. We will now have our student Senate report from Andrew Chandra from Wilson High School. Uh, Andrew's report will be a video report this evening. Good evening. This is Andrew Chandra, Wilson's Tuesday Thursday President and Student Senator, and here's Wilson's Fall 2023 Board Report. To start, here is an overview of what I will be covering in this presentation. At Wilson High School, we continue to strive for student success regardless of an individual's abilities. With our independent study format, Students can go at their own pace, and this 23-24 campaign has brought new opportunities, whether academically or socially. In the meantime, we continue to pursue our goal of student success in life. At Wilson, our motto for student success is the acronym GRAD, which stands for Goal-Oriented, Respectful, Accountable, and Dependable. We also run our activities, events, and fundraisers through Spirit and Leadership at Wilson. Our dual cohort club meets once a month on Monday and Tuesday from 11.40 to 12.10, consisting of Monday-Wednesday scheduled officers and Tuesday-Thursday scheduled officers. The club promotes school spirit and leadership by participating in ESC, Employer School Site Council, for fundraisers and by planning extracurricular school activities. In addition, Sal hosted a field trip this September to the Hiller Aviation Museum for a STEM fair as well as an improv comedy club a week later. We also offer lots of opportunity in our Wilson Den. Our menu offers water and snacks for students through trade-in tokens. Our Den Master also offers homework help to students. And, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, students can participate in lunchtime trivia. Students can also grab a clothing item from the clothes closet. Our den has offered several activities so far this semester. Wilson also offers gardening. It's a fun way to earn community service hours, and our plants include bok choy, radishes, and onions. And now for our activities. We kicked off our school year with an ice cream social, as students were glad to see familiar faces as well as welcome new students. On October 10th and 11th, we had our mental health fair with snacks and crafts, flyers, as well as Kahoot! with the winner receiving a gift card. On October 14th, Wilson hosted a Goodwill drive where we raised over $1,700. To kick off Halloween celebrations, we had, our, uh, we had our annual Halloween party where we offered treats, a music playlist selected by students, Kahoot, and a costume contest, and SAL also helped Wilson decorate for Halloween around campus and got community, community service hours for their hard work. The following week, we celebrated Halloween with trick-or-treating and continued costume themes. Our upcoming events at Wilson include our Thanksgiving party, Thanksgiving card making for seniors, our inaugural Wilson Winter World Cup, and our holiday party and movie. Thank you. That concludes Wilson's board report. Go Wolverines! Thank you. Just delightful. We will now have our reports from our union presidents. Ms. Villarreal. Good evening. Our report tonight is going to be a relatively short one in order to get our three-day weekend started as early as possible. On that note, I would like to take a moment to reflect on the reason why we have November 11th set aside as an annual day of recognition. Veterans Day originated in, on November 11th, 1919, the one-year anniversary of the armistice that ended World War I. President Woodrow Wilson declared that day Armistice Day, and in 1926, Congress passed a resolution to make it an annual occurrence. 
Now it has become a celebration to honor America's veterans for their patriotism, the love of country, their willingness to serve and sacrifice for the common good. So while you're enjoying your three-day weekend, give at least a moment of thought to one of our veterans. As CSA's role as partners in the district, at its sites and in all departments, it has evolved and expanded. Our members need to be equipped, educated, and empowered to make meaningful contributions. With that goal in mind, Chapter 350 hosted a two-part training held on consecutive Wednesday afternoons on members' own time for chapter leadership and involved members. It was presented by Ariana Tovez on the topic of being part of crucial conversations. Helpful information was shared, including mock scenarios where participants used their newly acquired skills and received constructive feedback in order to better participate in meetings and committees, as well as to be good, <clears throat> strong advocates and champions for themselves and their colleagues. It was very well received, and we hope to offer two more sessions in the spring. If you need brochures, translated materials, booklets, calendars, handbooks, maps, supplementary, supplementary materials, and all things printed, the district print shop is your place. This department has a team of one. Slide, please. This department the Classified Department of the Month has a team of one high boo. Since 1986, Hai has been the lead print shop equipment operator with his entire team of himself. He provides all 54 school sites and all departments with their print needs. And when you go to Hai with a print request, he listens to your need, interprets what you said, designs, creates, and then produces exactly what you envisioned accurately and efficiently. Last year, he used approximately 1 million pieces of paper to meet all of the district's printing needs. Thank you, hi. Alas, I cannot include, include my eagerly followed Giants report as baseball season has ended with Bruce Bochy's Texas Rangers winning the World Series, his fourth trophy as manager Three of them, by the way, with the Giants. But take heart, spring training is only 94 days and two hours away. This concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Waisaki. Good evening, President Fairchild, Dr. Waddell, Student Trustee Valdez, the Board of Trustees, and of course, Ms. Burrell. This evening, I have a few slides to share with you from two separate events. First, we have a picture of Christy Tapia, our MTSSB coach, from her presentation at the National PBIS Leadership Forum held in Chicago last month. Christy reported to UTSB leadership that it was a very successful conference. Next slide, please. Next, I'd like to share some pictures from the UTSC-sponsored Filipino Festival and Resource Fair held this past Saturday at Peterson Middle School. We'd like to offer a big shout out to Lillian Kwiatkowski and Angela Alferos for supporting and helping to organize this community event. Next slide, please. Students from Stanford presented to some of our secondary students on how to use your culture as a superpower and they offered tips on how to be a successful Philippine X american student. Next slide, please. Members from the Filipino Association of Workers and Immigrants attended, uh, and, attended and community members from the, had the opportunity to conference with a free legal clinic. We'd like to thank Lillian and Angela for engaging with our community in such a meaningful way. And there's, I think, just maybe one more slide. Thank you. UTSC would also like to share with the board that last week we had our second productive early literacy meeting as Dr. Waddell has spoken about. During the meeting, we reviewed the teacher survey responses by grade levels, looked at CASP data for 2022-2023 school year, and reviewed a lengthy research article. It was 40 pages. Um, and I'm 
partly to blame because I chose that one as well, on the acquisition of early literacy skills. I believe you'll learn more about our work in a presentation scheduled later this evening. We'd like to recognize that over the past few years, October has become a very long month with parent conferences and open houses, but we made it through. Well, tomorrow starts a three-day weekend, which we know our teachers will use to rest and recharge. It bears reminding each other why we celebrate Veterans Day. Lynn, good job. This federal holiday was established in 1954 to honor all American veterans past and present who have served in the military and who have fought for our freedoms we enjoy every single day. My father, who served in World War II, flew 35 miss missions as a waste gunner in a B-24 bomber. He was stationed in Shipham, England from November 44 to March 45. To my father and his buddies, all of whom are no longer with us, and to all of our veterans throughout our community, we'd like to offer our heartfelt thanks for your service and for your sacrifices. Our country is stronger because of your commitment. In the interest of time, so that we can start a nice long weekend, this will conclude my report. Have a good evening and have a good three-day weekend. Thank you so much. We will now have public comment on unagendized items. If you would like to speak on an item that is not on the agenda, this is the time for you to do so. Before we go out, I have a couple slips to members of the public. I would like to read our policy. The Board of Trustees has a policy on civility. Policy 1310.1 on civility states, this policy promotes mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among district employees, parents, and the public. This policy is not intended to deprive any person of his or her right to freedom of expression, but only to maintain, to the extent possible and reasonable, a safe, harassment-free workplace for our students and staff. In the interest of presenting district employees as positive role models to the children of this district, as well as the community, SUSD encourages positive communication and discourages volatile, hostile, or aggressive actions. This district seeks the public's cooperation with this endeavor. The public should note that while we value and want to receive public feedback, board members are prohibited by state law from commenting on, discussing, or taking action on items that are not on the meeting's agenda. The board may refer the commenter to a staff member or other resources for factual information, ask staff to report back to the board at a subsequent meeting concerning any matter, or take action directing staff to place a matter of business on a future agenda. When you come to the podium, please turn on the microphone. The green light indicates the microphone is on. You will have two minutes to speak. At the end of two minutes, please return to your seat. If you have additional comments, you may email the board. I have two slips for public comment at this time. I'd like to invite Katie Pedersen to come mm -hmm. up, followed by Dorothy Gio. Again, this is on items not on the agenda. Okay. Is the green light on? Yes. Okay. Good evening, esteemed board members. I'm Dr. Waddell. Um, my name is Katie Peterson. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a school psychologist in our district at Heyman Elementary School, and I also serve on the district's LGBTQQIA plus committee and on our UTSC Equity and Human Rights Committee. Um, I'm here today to uh, just continue to urge the board um, in collaboration with our Equity and Human Rights Committee, urge the board, urge our staff to continue to be thoughtful about the utilization of curricula that are inclusive and equitable. Um, our core values in this district include equity and social justice. And on that note, I wanted to read a short um, snippet from a book by Ibram X. Kendi, How to Raise an Anti-Racist. When the teacher primarily imparts the literature and history of white people in a multiracial society, to be racist is to call that education. When the teacher refuses to instruct young people about racism in a society of widespread racial inequity, 
To be racist is to call that education. When the teacher strives to impart the literature and history of multiple racial groups in a multiracial society, to be racist is to call that indoctrination. When the teacher instructs young people about racism in a society of widespread racial inequity, to be racist is to call that indoctrination. By this illogic, in a society of widespread racial inequity, racism exists as is a doctrine and racism doesn't exist is not a doctrine. Just again, um, thank you to the board for continuing to uphold our values. Thank you. I apologize. I neglected to mention that there was no public health update today, which is why we skipped to public comment. So just in case for those of you following the agenda, you may go ahead. I expected to talk much later in the evening, but prefer to do that because it's highly relevant to the exciting professional development that's going to take place in the high school. It's is this regarding an agenda item? Because you didn't put an agenda item on there. Agenda item, yes. Okay, so you, we'll have you wait until that agenda item. Yes. Let, what, which number is it? It's the agenda about taking the, the California system from 2020 uh, and applying it now to the a personalized competency-based training that will take place. Do you have a number, a letter, and anything? Um, it's it's the first item where Brad Stam uh, gets to present it. Way back in the agenda. Are you talking about the data presentation? The which? Uh, Maybe the knowledge the knowledge uh, based contracts which are at the middle school. I, I'm talking about the applying universal design to the professional training P, PCBL. And I'm sorry, I'm inexperienced in talking to you folks, so I haven't got the number. Okay, typically we do not have um, comment on our consent items, but we will consider that Yes, we'll have to pull that from consent for you to comment. So if you would like to sit down, if you're, and that's H what? Um, if you are speaking on an agenda item, it is very helpful if you look at the agenda item number and let us know what the agenda item is. Oh, okay, for those of you who, um, for those of you, thank you. Um, who have just turned in slip. This is a time for comment on items not on the agenda. Okay. All right. So now I will call up Manny Torres, Ali Torres, and Megan Fincher. Hello, I'm Manny. I'm from Westwood. Thank you so much, Manny. What do you want to tell the board? We want shade and we're also really hot. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you, Board of Trustees and Superintendent. My name is Ali Torres, and I'm a parent of three children at Westwood Elementary School, grades TK, first, and third. You just heard from my son, Manny. Earlier this week, we received an email um, from the bond measure regarding construction, and I wanted to specifically discuss um, the shade on campus, which is currently not being addressed. 
um, on sunny days, the asphalt, the heat can, um, the temperature in the air can be anywhere between like 85 degrees on average, but the blacktop can get up to 110. Um, I'm a yard duty and a volunteer on campus and the young children there are overheated and at risk of heat stroke and sunburn in those situations. Um, many of our students she seek shelter and they currently do not have an opportunity for that. Um, here you can see some of our kindergartners and TKers hiding underneath tables so that they're able to have shade. And we are so concerned about their well being. Currently, the only option for them is pop up tents and temporary shade structures, which we have been requesting since August and we have not yet been able to receive. As the temperatures do change, we are hopeful that our children will remain safe from the weather. However, we do not have any shade for them. That includes our TK and kindergartners whose trees were removed, as well as our first through fifth graders whose only shade tree is beyond their reach on the grass behind a fence, which they cannot currently access. Today, I would just ask that you would consider taking into account their safety and their need for shade and to be able to be outside and play in a safe environment. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. President uh, Fairchild, I believe this is actually K-1 is the topic, is part of the topic of that. So the reason I asked the question is at some point I would like to be able to comment. If it's on the agenda, I can comment. If it's not, I can't. So I would let you decide what's appropriate here. So I believe the reason that the individuals feel this isn't on the agenda is because it's about shade structures. Um, my comment's not about the shade, but it's some elements I think that are not in the current plan. Maybe. So are you addressed, if you're referring to the plan, then it needs to fall under the master plan agenda item. This is not, um, what I'm speaking on is not, it's about Westwood, but it's not about the master plan. Okay. Or am I good? You're good. Okay. Good evening, trustees and superintendent. My name is Megan Fincher. I'm a parent of a fourth grader at Westwood. I'm also a Westwood alumni. What I wanted to speak to you about tonight is regarding the Westwood Special Education Preschool, specifically the drop-off. Um, in years past, the preschool had a staggered drop-off and pickup time to avoid the busy drop-off and pickup times for K through five. Based on the new location on campus for the preschool and the current drop-off time, preschool parents struggle to find parking and many are forced to park in the red zone on Saratoga Avenue. They walk their children across the busy drop-off parking lot or driveway where many parents are not paying attention. I drive through this lot every morning to drop off my fourth grader and I see how dangerous it is. Thankfully, the fifth grade safety patrol officers are doing their best to signal cars to stop when preschoolers and parents need to cross. This feels like an accident waiting to happen and I'm very concerned about this. I highly suggest moving the start time of the preschool from 8.15 to 8.30 to solve this safety issue. We invite you to visit our campus to observe and kindly request your support in finding solutions for this. Thank you. Do we have any other members of the public who would wish to address an unagendized item and an item that's not on the agenda, you may come forward. Good evening. My name is Dee Umo, and I oppose the equity framework that is being proposed by the district. I believe it will inflict more harm than the good it purports. At the last board meeting, I mentioned how Black Lives Matter is an organization and movement highly lauded in these equity conversations as if they speak for the Black Collective. They don't. Just look at the data. By 2020, um, BLM and its affiliates amassed over 80 billion in pledges and contributions. Relatively little of these funds went to support black families impacted by police brutality. It was only after much outcry, namely by the, by the families of Tamir Rice, Miranda Taylor and others, even lawsuits by other BLM affiliates that the organization came to the aid of bereaved families who previously accused BLM for profiting off the deaths, deaths of their loved ones. BLM has not helped black people get jobs or get educated. 
In 2023, Black employment is at historical lows despite wider job market stability. Despite all the pledges of Fortune 500 companies to increase hiring for diversity efforts, clearly all of the brand activism that happened back in 2020 hasn't worked out for Black people. Last year in, 20, last year in 23 Baltimore City schools, zero students tested proficient in math. This statistic is, rel is reflective of the dismal speed dismal state of black students in education across the country. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's black BLM, it's not bringing black families together. Instead, it breaks them apart. It downplays the importance of husbands and fathers in the nuclear family structure. The black man is useless unless he's dead. That's how they profit. BLM doesn't care about black babies. The bloodshed of innocent life is instead called healthcare. Of the 60 million babies aborted since Roe v. Wade, over 20 million of them were black. Um, it's not helping black businesses. Instead, it loots, steals, and burns them to the ground. Um, families and livelihoods are ruined. Violent crime is increasing across this country. Blacks make up 50, 52% of homicide victims, with women and girls Thank increasingly you. becoming the number Thank one you. statistic. Mm -hmm. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address the board on an item not on the agenda? Do we have any hands raised in the Zoom? Thank you. President oh, yeah. Fairchild? Yes, Trustee Lieberman. Um, going back to the comment made by uh, Megan Fincher, um, can I please ask staff to um, look into that issue at drop-off at Westwood for the preschool and um, report back to us about um, how they're addressing it? Thanks. Thank you. Would staff please grit. look into that and report back to the board? Okay. We'll now go out to public comment on the Zoom. For members of the public attending through the Zoom webinar who would like to speak, please use Zoom's raise hand tool. Public speakers will be called upon in the order that hands were raised. There will be a two minute timer on the screen, similar to the one we have in the boardroom to help you to moderate your comments. To ensure everyone has the same amount of speaking time, we will have to move on to the next commenter after two minutes. When your name is called, you will be prompted by Zoom to unmute. Our first commenter is Claudia Sifuentes. You should be allowed to speak now, Claudia. Yes, can you hear me? Hello everyone, my name is Claudia and my son attends Westwood Preschool with an IEP. I wanted to draw attention to the playground and also the drop-off issue that we are facing, the playground for starters. Our three and four-year-olds already face difficulties with their day-to-day -day life, whether it be speech, basic understanding of uh, requests and transitions, and they are yet expected to walk across the entire campus to use the kindergartner's playground. I know from personal experience that my son has difficulties with transitions and having him do this every single day causes him stress, takes time away from him actually learning and building his gross motor skills. Last year, they had their own playground and this was not an issue. This year, they are having yet another blocker placed on top of their day-to-day -day difficulties. With regards to the parking, last year we were able to drop off at, at Bohannon Avenue this year, the portables were changed due to the construction needs. And let me tell you, it is congested, it is unsafe, and there is extremely limited parking. We had zero issues at drop-off last year because of the calmness of Bohannon. Since the portables were moved due to the construction, this year there is so much commotion that my son has difficulties walking to class. I know that these changes are a result of the improvements that are being made to the school, which is great, but it really seems like our preschoolers and their teachers were forgotten about. My hope is not only that the district listens to our children's true needs, but also puts forth an action plan to get this resolved as soon as possible to help them be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alejandra Rosado Almeida.
Alejandra, you should be able to begin talking. Hola, buenas noches. ¿Me pueden escuchar? Sí. sí. Buenas, buenas noches. Hola. You, puedes hablar. Muchas gracias. Voy a hablar en español porque es mi lengua nativa y me encuentro más fácil comunicando de esta forma. Yo soy mamá de... Un momento, un momento. Jose, sorry. Dr. González, can you translate? Can you double her time? Um, can you explain that you're going to translate and have her pause every second or so? Thank you. Every sentence or so. Sí, señora, yo voy a traducir lo que diga. Este, eh, permíteme solamente escuchar unas cuantas oraciones para poder traducir. Le agradezco mucho. Comience. Buenas noches a todos. Yo soy Alejandra Rosado. Soy mamá de un alumno de quinto año de Westwood. So good evening. My name is uh, Alejandra Rosado. I am the parent of a child in fifth grade at Westwood. Estoy aquí para este, expresar mi preocupación en relación a la falta de áreas con sombra en el área de juegos de los niños. I am here in regards to the lack of shades in the playground areas at Westwood. Como la señora Ali Torres mencionó, eh, yo también estoy en yard duty y me he dado cuenta de cómo los niños pueden llegar a acalorarse demasiado. Incluso algunos de ellos, después de su tiempo de descanso, tienen que ir a clases de ejercicio, de educación física, y todo esto es bajo el sol. In the same manner that Ms. Ali Torres is a yard duty, I am also a yard duty, and I witness when students um, are in the, in the playground um, exposed to the heat, and then even after that, they have uh, physical education. Se, sería bueno que tomaran en cuenta esta situación y ayudaran a nuestra directora, Coringa Fari, para que no generarle más problemas. Al contrario, ayudarla porque es una escuela grande, es una escuela llena de retos y ella es una mujer que está completamente dedicada al trabajo en Westwood. Muchas it, gracias. It would be great to support uh, Principal Cory Gafari and she's very dedicated in the school. It's a, it's a big school and we need support in the school to have the appropriate shade. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, for that on the spot translation for those of us on the board. Okay, next. Our next speaker is Claudia Cifuentes. Oh, excuse me. Uh, our next speaker is Serena. Serena, you should be able to speak now. Hi, are you guys able to hear me? Okay. Hi, um, I'm Serena. I'm a special ed preschool uh, teacher from Westwood. I'm here on behalf of my preschool students to express that we don't have a playground for them to, um, to access. Special ed preschool classrooms are relocated um, during phase 1A. Prior to that, we had a playground just for um, our preschooler right outside of our classrooms, which was so much easy to access. Currently, my students are walking 200 yards each way to access the kinder playground. And that's literally, again, taking five minutes or even more, depending on how the kids are transitioning based on their behaviors. Um, again, it's a, all uh, literally across campus, and it has been really challenging to just get those students back and forth every good uh, transition back and forth every day. Not only are the students physically just tired of walking, but some of them are exhibiting behaviors due to the distance. And some students are not even able to make it to the playground because distance have been triggering their behaviors. We have students who can easily elope, literally walking from one end to the other. One, it's just not accessible, it's not feasible, and it's not even reasonable, reasonable to ask my preschoolers with disabilities to walk back and forth to and from the playground every day. It's ridiculous that we even have to ask for the bare minimal of what's right for my students. It's frustrating that special ed preschools always been overlooked as if we do not exist. I'm not here to blame anyone, but I'm exhausted having to fight for my students. And it just seems like no one cares that preschool needs a playground. 
And I love how many admins just play the card of like, oh, I had no idea that preschoolers had no playground at Westwood. And on top of that, preschooler teachers were asked to do a donor's choose as a solution to ask for some of the things that my students need for this playground to replace the playground. I think I'm just, I was just shocked. I had no words. And I hope that you guys are able to hear us on this, how important it is for my preschoolers to have a playground of their own. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Brooke Gaeta, you are the next speaker. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good evening, my name is Brooke Gaeta and I am a Westwood parent of a kindergartner and a fourth grader. I'm also a former Westwood preschool parent. So I completely understand uh, the drop off every morning at 815. It's it's quite hard on parents and kids um, for uh, during that time. Uh, I live on Bohannon, so I had witnessed um, a smoother drop off transition on that side of the school. However, it was still very difficult for very for many parents um, during that time in the morning because of the behavioral issues that they have. Um, I can't even imagine what it's like for them to walk 200 yards across the school alongside the school where there is no shade. Um, and both of my children in kinder and in fourth do come home uh, complaining about the heat during the hot months as well. Uh, the playground for the preschool, I was sad to see it go. I thought it was going to be restored and moved to where the new preschool buildings are. But unfortunately, I just learned this week that they are using the kindergarten playground. And being that my child is in kindergarten, he has told me that um, the, the classroom is being disrupted due to the preschool capacity on the yard during that time of their recess when they actually make it to the kindergarten playground. As far as my fourth grader, she does talk about the um, inadequate amount of shade that they are having during the hot months. And so I would like to see if that could be addressed um, and there could be a solution, whether it be temporary. The pop-up tents uh, sounds like that might be a difficult task every morning to put up and bring down if that's what it's saying that we are to do eventually if that were the case. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Samantha Purcell. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for having me on Zoom. Um, I'm the parent of a first and third grader at Westwood. My daughter was actually a proud peer role model two years ago in the SCUSD special education preschool at Westwood. This program not only empowers neuro neurodivergent preschoolers, but their neurotypical peers as well, which is why I thought it was so important to speak out to you all when I found out about the preschool playground oversight. Their old playground was removed by no fault of their own, and now there are preschoolers there right now losing valuable education minutes right now and early interventions right now due to the lack of an easily accessible playground. Westwood preschool students should have the same resources and facilities such as play structure as other special needs preschools in Santa Clara Unified. All young children, regardless uh, of who they are and their skills or abilities, deserve the free right of free, unrestricted, full-bodied play in fresh air. They cannot wait for a playground to be worked on into the budget and scheduled for 10 to 20 years down the road. By then they will be adults and I hope they will be thriving because we met them when and where it mattered most, those early formative foundational years. The program itself is amazing, run by amazing teachers, one that the district should be proud of. We are only asking that the facilities match and meet the quality that our amazing staff thoughtfully puts forward every day. Thank you. Dr. Waddell, is that the long, last comment? Um, Dr. Waddell, could you come bring an item back at the, our next board meeting to just address the numerous concerns that were brought forward regarding drop-off, the um, proximity to a play structure for SAI preschoolers, as well as the shade? We will. Thank you. 
That was pretty much what I wanted to do is make sure we got this brought back to the next board meeting and the staff work with them. But also K-1 does cover a few of these. There's overlap on these two projects. So I do know I may ask a few questions under K-1, uh, agenda item K-1, where we can respond. We legally can't respond to anything on the on, on agenda. So I don't know. Right. So we can just go forward then. Thank that you. Good. Thank you. Okay, we will now go on to our consent items. Um, we will start with our consent items for human resources. That is uh, items G1, 2, and 3. Do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. We have a motion and a second. It will be a roll call vote because we have two board members on the Zoom. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes. So that passes. Didn't call me. I didn't call Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Muirhead. Yes. I must have skipped you. Sorry. Okay. So that passes seven to zero. We will now do consent items, other consent items, items H, um, one through 22. However, we are Skipping H20, I have a conflict of interest, and then we will pull also H22. So do I have a motion for the other consent items? Move to approve H1 through H19 and H21. And a second. Okay, let's do our roll call. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. I vote yes. Trust, student Trustee Valdez? Yes. And that passes seven to zero, and I will be leaving the room. Move to approve H.20. Second, Rodderman. Well, you know, the chair's supposed to call for the motion, but that's okay. No worries. But um, so we have a motion from Trustee Ratterman. We have a second from Trustee no. Muirhead, no. correct? No. No. I'm, I had the I'm a second. Oh, oh, you're the second? And you're the, okay, so motion and second. Uh, any questions or discussion from the board? Okay, this is roll call. So um, I will start with myself since we're doing this in that order. I say yes. Um, um, Trustee yes. Gonzalez. Yes. Uh, Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Muirhead. Yes. Trustee Ratterman. Yes. Trustee Ryan. Yes. And of course, Vicki is outstanding. And our, stu our student, Trustee Val Valdez. Yes. Okay, so that motion carries uh, with um, Trustee or Board President Vicki not in attendance. So now she'll return to the room. And there she is. And there we go. Okay, we will now do H22, and we will start with a public comment by Dorothy Gill. It's hugely exciting to me as a retired teacher to see right there in the budget money for professional development. And I'm referring to what's going to happen for six days and on site and six hours of off site uh, uh, support. And so what I'm referring to now is the way it's described in the agenda in which it's a big framework from 2020 that the state of California has put out uh, married to what this district is doing, which is personalized and competency based. And so how do you get that to, the piece, those two pieces of learning together? And the kind of learning that I've been thinking about is the kind of learning which needs to happen from TK onward, which is how kids learn to read and get support. I come from the Santa Clara Science of Reading Coalition, which is a group devoted to helping the whole district from the board onward to help the kids to have ways of reading effectively. And the first way, which is comes right 
in this 2020 Calif framework is use science. And so it's exciting to hear the report today that the team who's on early literacy has started with a 42 page article that gets into the research is uh, from England and Australia. So it's much better to use that in conjunction with a lot of American research. And so what I'm saying about this opportunity, which is gonna happen in the high school is let the teachers aforehand go for 0.4 of the framework and do their own plan. Thank you, thank you. Do we have a motion to approve H22 and a second? Okay, we will do a roll call vote. Trustee Canova? An enthusiastic yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Trustee Ryan has had to leave the meeting. Okay. I vote yes. Uh, student Trustee Valdez? Yes. That passes six to zero with Trustee Ryan being absent and student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. We will now move on to action item I-1, the second reading and approval of board policy 5116.12. Do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. And a second. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? There are no slips or hands, so we'll go straight to our vote. Uh, Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent. I also vote yes. Student Trustee Valdez? Yes. That passes six to zero with Trustee Ryan being absent and Student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. We now have action item J.1, appointment of the vice principal at Santa Clara High School. We have a motion. A second. second. And a second. Dr. Gonzalez. Good evening, board members, Dr. Waddell and Ms. Burrell. It is my pleasure to introduce Erica Marcuccillo. Erica received her BA in political science and art history from Santa Clara University, as well as her teaching credential and a master's in interdisciplinary education and educational administration. Erica is coming to Santa Clara from Campbell Union High School District, where she has been the activities director at Lee High School for the past three years. Prior to working as an activities director, Erica was a principal for nine years at California Virtual Academy. Some of Erica's responsibilities and duties included leading professional learning communities around a common standards-based curriculum, facilitating weekly staff meetings to analyze data and set goals, conducting teacher evaluations, providing professional development opportunities for teachers around project-based learning, MTSS and classroom engagement, participating in weekly IEP meetings, cultivating parent involvement through consistent written and verbal communication, and addressing all parent concerns and leading the parent orientation sessions for new families. Thank you. Thank you, any discussion? Can you tell me who, got, who you gave the second to? Jean, who was the second? Is this for your notes? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. All right, Trustee Canova. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Muirhead. Yes. Trustee Ratterman. Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent. I vote yes. That passes six to zero with Trustee Ryan being absent. We'll now move on to action item K1. That's a master plans and phase 1B projects for Bracker Elementary, Briarwood Elementary, and Westwood Elementary School. Um, for those of you who are new to a board meeting, for these agenda items, we will first hear a presentation. Um, then we will go to comments from the board, and then we will go out to the public. I would like to appreciate, uh, show appreciation to our staff for their thorough job in these reports. They have been coming to the board for some time. And so I know there's a, a renewed interest tonight. So I'd like to turn the time over to Mr. Scheel, who would like to introduce the item. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, so we're at the stage now where we have the next phase of the Measure VB projects, and that's for Bracker, Briarwood, and Westwood. 
so we have updates uh, to the master plans this evening based upon feedback that we've received from the community and the board in prior meetings. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, updated the cost analysis for each one of these projects, uh, developed the project 1B uh, or phase 1B for each one of these projects as well uh, that fit within the measure BB guidance. Um, and then we also have information for you in regards to in order to complete that, the estimated cost, all in cost for each one of those projects as we move forward. Um, we On two of the projects, uh, a little spoiler alert, uh, for two of the projects, the cost came in higher uh, than the amount of funds that we had available within the Measure BB. And so um, I want to extend um, kudos to... Um, both Larry and Michelle in coming up with some really creative solutions and how to um, ra uh, fulfill the obligations and find alternative funding sources to continue to move these projects forward. Um, also, I don't wanna step on uh, Michelle and Larry's toes, but what I will also say is to the community members who spoke this evening, um, we heard you. Um, we have uh, responses to many of the comments that you had this evening. Um, I sent an email out to all of those individuals that emailed us over the last several days. They received an email from me earlier this evening in regards to uh, the plan of action for all of those as well. So we will also be able to address many of those comments this evening uh, that are within the Measure BB uh, purview. And so with that, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Michelle and Larry. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we will be discussing the Brecker, Barwood, and Westwood Elementary School Master Plans as Phase 1B projects. We're going to start with the review of the master plans, and then I did um, reorganize the slides a little bit to make it flow a little bit better than what's on your agenda. So we're going to go through all of Brecker, including Measure 1B projects, and then all of Briarwood and then all of Westwood and then finalize with the funding instead of going through the master plans and then doing the measure B1, um, 1B projects and then the funding. So we're hoping it'll be a little bit more streamlined in this, this way. We started with the master plans back in September of 2021 and this was with LPA Architects. And we started um, doing some focus groups and community meetings in the spring of 22 and the fall of 22. And we finalized the measure BB1A projects for summer construction of 23 in the winter of 23. In the spring and summer, we finalized the master plans and we finalized the phase 1B projects that are funded and Laura, Larry will be presenting those later. Right now, we're looking for approval of the master plans as well as the phase 1B projects to move forward with measure BB funding. As I've presented previously, we've had a lot of site and community engagement throughout this process. We've met with the school site staff, we've met with people within the district, and we've met with the community several times for each of the Bracker, Briarwood, and Westwood to come up with these cohesive plans. As a reminder, the master plans are the final master plan. So there are 30 year facility plans for each of the three sites and they will be phased as future money comes in. But right now what we're looking approval for is the final master plan, that 30 year plan, and then the measure 1B that is funded from measure BB as well as other funding pots of money. Starting with Bracker, this is the existing site plan and uh, Bracker has a children's center as well as many classrooms and a small multi-purpose. And so for part of the master plan, our end result shows a new multipurpose as well as new early education classrooms up in the Northwest portion of the school site that's currently undeveloped and removal of all the portables where the current child center is at the South of the campus and a new two-story classroom building there with fourth and fifth grade, as well as a STEM lab, a library and some extended day classrooms. And now Larry will talk about what is funded and what we're moving forward with for Measure 1B for Bracker. Uh, good evening. Uh, Michelle and the architect that I worked on uh, scopes of work for Phase 1B that that is feasibly uh, achievable with the funding that we have um, and goes as far as we can go. 
uh, towards a, the eventual a full uh, final master plan. So at, at Bracker, um, the Bracker project includes a new multi-purpose building uh, with a full cooking kitchen and a shaded uh, lunch eating area. It includes a complex uh, on number two in the upper right-hand corner uh, for uh, TK preschool SAI buildings with a, a play area and a shade structure. Uh, it includes um, a, a metal PE a shade structure. This is a metal building uh, with a roof on it uh, so that um, it, kids will be protected from the rain as well as the sun. Uh, it will probably have lighting. Uh, it's, it's essentially a building. So it's, it's quite a step up from the uh, uh, fabric shade structures that we've done in the past. Uh, but again, we also have a fabric shade structure in the preschool, um, in the preschool uh, playground. And, and then finally, uh, all of the parking uh, driveway frontage on uh, Chromite uh, gets replaced. Uh, so we'll have all a new parking lot, new pickup drop off drives and uh, new driveways on the on the um, the upper right hand corner of the property. This is the existing Briarwood site plan. And as you can see, there's a lot well, there. It's a little small. I apologize. But uh, there's a lot of portables on the Briarwood campus. But their number one priority was modernizing their existing classrooms since Briarwood is not expected to grow like Bracker is. So the modernization focused on the master plan focuses on modernization of the existing classrooms, as well as increasing all right, as well as um, adding a new kitchen onto the multi-purpose and enlarging that so that it would be a full cooking kitchen, redoing the parking lot, adding a stage to the existing multi-purpose and then modernizing all of the lower grade classrooms to be flexible for preschool, kindergarten, and TK, and demolishing those portables at the north section of the property and building a new flex classroom that would, could be used indoors for PE or other um, act, joint activities as well as extended day. And Larry's going to talk about the uh, phase 1B projects for Briarwood. A phase 1B a project for Briarwood. Um, can't read the numbers from here. Um, the the two, okay, thank you. The two uh, classroom wings on the lower portion of the site uh, get major remoder, uh, reconfiguration and modernization. Uh, to reconfigure them into a uh, flex classrooms, um, a TK and uh, preschool and kindergarten classrooms. So those are uh, completely redone. Um, we add a uh, shade structure in the uh, uh, what is now the kindergarten playground uh, that becomes a preschool playground. And then there are uh, a group of portables right on the lower side of the uh, of the campus in the green area. Those portables are removed and that gets converted into a, a new kindergarten play area with a shade structure. Um, we're also installing a metal PE a shade structure in the um, in the hard court area. I talked about that at uh, Bracker, so it's it's the same same structure. And then we're also uh, reconfiguring the entire frontage of the school with pickup drop off and a new um, a new, uh, 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 I guess you would call it a lobby area in front of the in front of the office. There's also an issue with a retaining wall along the uh, the upper right hand corner of the property, and we're we're going to rebuild that all the way to the edge of the property. Uh, total project cost here. I ne neglected to mention that previously, but to, that I'll discuss that a little bit later. But total project cost here is thirty million. Our target uh, completion is fall of 2026. That's a target. Um, we're, we have a long way to go on these projects on both uh, estimates and budgets and, uh, and completion uh, schedules. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that uh, at the end. 
The next site we'll be reviewing is Westwood. And this is the existing Westwood campus. I think all of us know that there's a lot of portables on this campus. And so the main goal at the end of the master plan is to remove all of the portables from the campus. The master plan consists of many new buildings on this site. We'll be removing classrooms to make a new multipurpose that'll be the center of the campus and the hub with a new kitchen. And then building a new early childhood center at the lower portion of the campus, which is currently where the kindergarten playground is. So the new master plan includes an early childhood area, which includes preschool, TK, as well as kinder, and a new play area for all of those. There's a new wellness center and a indoor flex space that's about the size of two classrooms that we're planning that could be used for indoor PE or other group activities when it's raining or when it's too smoky outside. And then in the north where those classroom wings in the north, we had a big debate over whether to modernize those two wings since they were built in the 2000s or whether to demolish them and build something new. And those classrooms are smaller. They're the, some of the smallest classrooms that we have on our school's campuses. They're under, um, they're under 900 square feet each. And so the joint decision on this campus was to demolish them and build a new two-story classroom wing. And that classroom wing would also include the library and a STEM lab. And um, it would include the third, fourth, the second, third, fourth, and fifth grade classrooms. And then at the end, all of the portables disappear and there's a lovely new field at the end um, of this project. Okay, let me just say that this Westwood's the most challenging by far of the three projects because of the current configuration and the way the, way the school was built in relation to the property lines. Um, the first major uh, portion of phase 1B is a new multi-purpose building, full cooking kitchen, and a, a fabric shaded lunch court uh, in the center of the campus. Uh, we take the wing, the existing wing that's just above the library wing, uh, demolish that. We'll build the multi-purpose building, kitchen, and uh, shaded lunch court. And then in a second phase, we'll tear down the existing uh, uh, multi-purpose building and then rebuild the parking lot, pick up and drop off. Um, in the uh, playground, uh, note number two, we have the uh, P, uh, the metal PE shade building um, that will be constructed generally in that location. And then we're it's not shown on the drawings, but we are on that drawing right there, but we are uh, adding a fabric shade structure in the current kindergarten uh, playground. Um, that wasn't installed this summer, uh, but um, we're, we're going to include that and we're gonna include that and the metal uh, shade structure building in a first phase of phase 1B. And we'll get started on that as soon as we can. I've got uh, a meeting with the uh, LPA architects on Monday. And this is one of the first things we'll be talking about is how, do we, how can we jumpstart those two projects? Uh, while I'm talking about Westwood, let me talk about the um, the turf uh, uh, area that, that we con uh, constructed this summer. We weren't able to finish it. We had some grading and irrigation issues. Um, so we got part of it seeded, um, but we had to wait for that seed to get established. It's pretty well established now, so we think we can take the fences down early next week. So we'll have students to have student access to that uh, sometime next week. And then the second phase of it is being constructed right now. We think in the next week to two weeks, we'll get seed in the ground. And at this at this time of year, um, seed and sod uh, take about the same time to be able to mature enough for students to be on them. So uh, so our goal is to get that, that entire sod area uh, playable as soon as possible. Our total project, uh, uh, budget and cost on Westwood is 45 million. Uh, we're, we're shooting for uh, fall of 2026, but we have a long way to go. We've just, we'll just be starting with the architects. Uh, we need to get a construction manager on board and we'll be able to get a better um, fix on completion date um, as, as we get into the project. 
um, yeah. Okay, funding. Thank you. Um, the to our total estimates. Um, the architect has hired a cost estimator to do estimates on these projects based on the drawings that you saw right there. Um, total for all three projects, total 141 million. Um, given that there's not a lot of detail on the project right now, we did a lot of rounding and I included a lot of uh, res uh, project reserves as well. Our current project budget available on Measure BB is about 75, 76 million. So we have a $65 million uh, deficit. These three projects, we anticipated from the very beginning of Measure BB that we would be drawing on a, 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 a bond um, program and escalation reserves to do these projects. So it wasn't an, it was always anticipated that we would need to uh, uh, tap reserves and able to, to, to complete these projects. At Bracker, our, Bracker is the most expensive of the, of the three projects. Um, there's a lot of new construction there and of the three projects, we have a lot more um, site improvement area to do there, and so, uh, so we're, we're and so we're we're proposing to tap about uh, about twenty nine million dollars out of Measure BB reserves, and then to close the gap at uh, Bracker because we're building new construction, and Bracker is a campus that uh, that has. Uh, a large amount of new housing units in its attendance area. Um, we're thinking that that is a legitimate expenditure for developer fees. So here we're proposing a 30, uh, 35.6 million uh, be allocated to the Bracker budget uh, out, of, out of developer fees. So we have a total estimated cost of 141 million. And then with reserves, we're, at, we're proposing a budget to equal the estimated cost of 141 million. And um, so what's the impact on the Measure BB uh, reserves? Currently we have we have about $75 million available uh, in reserves that, that we have not used. We've used a significant portion of program reserves, but we haven't used any escalation reserves yet out of our uh, 2018 uh, uh, bond measure. Um, and so, uh, so we're proposing out of the 75 million that we have available, we use about 29 million, and that leaves a 45.9 million left in program reserves. And that the uh, only two projects uh, that we we have yet to um, fully kick off are um, the New Valley uh, uh, relocation project and the Peterson Peterson Fields. So this is tight. Uh, for those projects, but we think it's achievable. Anything else? Thank you so much. I would like to turn the time over to Mr. Shield before we go to board comment, and then we will go out to the public. Thank you. So I, I wanted to say first, again, thank you to both of you. Um, it's been a lot of work over almost two years now, so thank you. Um, the other things I want to say is uh, there's going to be two complexities with this project that is a little bit different for the district that we haven't seen in recent years. Um, one of those unique challenges is doing construction on a campus that is housing students. And so that is a complexity that also impacts timelines as well, that um, as you heard Larry saying several times, we're, we're targeting fall 2026, but some of these challenges are, are some of this is happening in areas where students are currently and education is currently happening. And so how do we work on the timeline in that and still not impact learning and also still maintain a safe learning environment? So that's one of the unique challenges. The second piece is um, under fall of 2026 is, and I, and I said this earlier in an email that I sent out to some community members is while we're talking about an estimated completion date today of fall 2026, we anticipate that some projects will be done sooner than that. So it's not like some of the other new construction that we've done recently where we wait until the entire project is done and then open it up. There will be some components of this, like some of the shade structures and things like that, where we hope to be able to do sooner 
as as soon as starting and breaking ground this fall so that way we can get those done earlier and then there's some of these projects will be brought online sooner rather than having to wait all the way until the end to have some of those things completed and so um that's there we, we call them the phase 1b projects but there may be phases within the phase in order to get these done quicker which we'll need to do cuz fall 2026 means we only have two summers um, and that's not a lot of time to try to get these projects done um, on a campus that is currently occupied. And then we're dealing with three projects all being occupied at the same time. So um, those are two different complexities that I wanted to add that we didn't have within our presentation. And so with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you so much. We will now allow for one round of board comment before we go out to the board, um, the public. Trustee Ratterman. I've been to quite a few of the meetings that you've had trying to make sure that we incorporate all of the public comment and concerns of teachers and staff and parents. And, and I know it's a very, very technical, difficult process to do. But, you know, a concern that I brought up a couple of times has to do with the transition between phases, okay? Um, you know, how do we get from point A to point B? What are the timelines to do that? Um, how do we ensure that we have facilities that uh, provide quality education, safety, those types of things. And so one of the concerns I would have, uh, and Mark may be the one who can answer this, is whether or not we've anticipated those needs and built costs in, because we're going to have to put up some temporary structures that get torn down. We're, you know, And those should be planned when you're doing your Gantt chart or whatever you use, so that those happen first, do we make sure? And certainly mistakes can happen and things the unexpected can happen, but I'd like to see that that is a, a real uh, something. And if, if a big problem comes up, we wait, we, we delay the project. And I realize there's consequences to the delays, but our first priority is the kids, the students and, and their safety and their making sure they get a quality education. You know, I was involved actually in the upgrade process and Larry remembers this in 2000s on the measure B funds at Westwood. Um, and we actually had a couple of things that went a little wrong. Uh, for instance, one of the things is they ended up cutting all of the, water lines to the, the, there was no water for the kids out in the playground. And so uh, we did fix that. We went and complained and, and Paul Parati actually was the one involved and, and Rod Adams. And we got portable water coolers that the district paid for to put them out there. Initially, the problem was that everybody was worried about who would pay for them. And we finally got some parents involved and took care of that. So I would like us not to go through those kind of process. Let's try to anticipate. And when we get feedback from the public, let's see if we could jump on it right away. These portable shade structures, yes, um, maybe a 10 by 10 isn't right going out to one of these uh, companies that, um, you know, rents them for a commercial and they, they put stakes in the ground and they, they're semi-permanent until you need to pull them out. But I do empathize with a lot of what I heard earlier. It was extraordinarily difficult to stay quiet during that session. Thank you. Um, I will say that throughout all the process, we did take into account the phasing on each of the master plans. And so um, eventually there will be a full master plan booklet that comes with these master plans and it will show what's in each phase. And we, we were very uh, cautious and we thought about when interim housing would be needed, when it wouldn't be needed, as well as those phases and how that affects it. And I think that really went into what is included in measure 1B, um, especially, we spent a lot of time talking to each of the school sites, letting them know what was the impacts would be when they're moving out of classroom wings. And luckily for these, we do believe that we won't need interim housing for any of these projects. With the declining enrollment, each of these sites have extra classrooms, so we'll be able to move class students into existing classrooms for them. We will reanalyze that when we start the construction and and relook at that based on the existing enrollment numbers. But for now, that's something that we were very conscious of and we took into account and then we took that into account for all of the estimates. Larry, did you want to add anything? I, I will be while Larry's coming up. Um, so um, to add your other comment, there are significant reserves built into this to provide some flexibility. As you saw, we still would have about $70 million available in reserves. But mindful, we still have two projects that we haven't finalized yet, both the Peterson uh, fields as well as New Valley. But we do have some reserves in addition to that available. Um, and safety is something that is on the forefront of our mind. Um, I remember even a meeting, the three of us had a meeting earlier this week, or maybe it was last week. It's kind of running together. Um, and where Larry was talking about 
you know, some of this is going to require some demolition. And so by, by being able to move faster and quicker with some of this information, maybe there may be an opportunity to do some of that demolition even this summer. So that way we get it done where there are no kids on campus on these, on these campuses, do some of that dem demolition. I've been on a campus. You can do demolition while staff is happening, while learning is happening. Um, and we did that in my prior district, but it was, it was tricky and there's risks associated with that. But if there's a way for us to safely do it when kids and staff aren't on campus, then we're going to explore those opportunities as well. And so we are expand, exploring all those things in the course of this timeline. Uh, the last thing I will say is um, sometimes you don't know what you know until you open up the ground or the walls. And so there will always be surprises uh, because we can't always estimate and guesstimate what is going to be in walls and below ground until we actually get into it. Anything else, Larry? Thank you. We will ha now go to Trustee Canova, followed by Trustee Gonzalez, and then Trustee Lieberman. You're now in the queue. First of all, I, I thank you for the way the presentation went because it really did have a nice flow. Uh, so greatly appreciated. Uh, so many people in the district that we're proud of, but you two are probably the most detail-oriented people I know. And so I, I have no doubt that there's probably no stone that you've left unturned. I really appreciate the, um, the information you put up in terms of the uh, stakeholder input, which is impressive. That's a tremendous amount of input. And that's a tremendous amount of work to get that input, which probably takes up a, quite a bit of the schedule that you've had over the past couple of years, but it's really appreciated. Um, also, just the uh, funding piece too. I really like the flexibility in your thinking. You're, you're being very creative with respect to the funding and that's really greatly appreciated as well. So I'm pleased, I'm impressed and, um, and you two are rock stars. Thank you. Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you, Madam President. And thank you for the report. I think it's really uh, nice and uh, it's always uh, really important. And I'm glad that we did a lot of the stakeholder meetings to make sure that we got more input. Um, and obviously sometimes when uh, we're doing things, we're moving trees and things, it's always for the safety of students. I've been on a campus where a limb falls down and you know it's good that nobody was underneath it. But um, as we move forward, um, we have a lot of learn experience from some of the things that we've done. I can just think about the Wilcox uh, camp where we, uh, instead of putting, I think it was 58 portables um, or, or whatever the number was, um, we went, we built a three story wing. So there's things that we've done. 50? Okay. Yeah. And they got to play on the football field instead of having portables. But yeah, there's things that we've done and learned from to uh, make sure that we can meet the needs of the students. And obviously, there's priorities as far as shade structures. I know the Department of the State Architect is not very lenient on things, and we can't just put in a whole bunch of ten by tens or something. I mean, there's certain things that that were required, you know, by law, and we just can't do certain things because of a DSA. Um, but whatever we can do to make sure that we our priorities are for the for the needs of the, of the children. Obviously, it's not getting really hot right now, but come a few months, it's going to be very much warmer than it is today. So, what we can do to uh, to make sure that we can do that, obviously, we would like to not spend the money and then tear it down later. But if that's something that we have to do, then that's something that we have to do. Um, and uh, the, I know we use the subprime method as far as um, the way that we build things. If it design, and I forgot the name, but like lease, lease back or whatever, you know, happens in some other, other districts, if we can move quicker by do, using some of the other methods, I think we should look into that. Um, I know we have a history of, of doing it a certain way, but, uh, Whatever can facilitate us getting things in quicker, I think, will be uh, beneficial to not only not only our staff but in our students, which is really important. And uh, thank you for looking at ways that we can minimize the impact of students by doing things in the summer. I know we've done that quite quite extensively, and I think that's something that we've uh, I'm sure we'll be doing here as well. Thank you, Trustee Lieberman. Trustee Lieberman, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, President Fairchild. Um, thank you uh, also to Mr. Scheel and Mr. Uh, Adams and Ms. Healy 
Uh, I know how hard y'all work uh, and this presentation as always, I say this to Ms. Healy every time she presents, but um, your presentations are always my favorite. Um, they're, they're just spectacularly done. Um, I, I, some of my comments I've, I've already spoken with Mr. Shill about, um, but I, I have every confidence in our bond department and facilities department to address um, these is some of these issues that have come up tonight, shade, um, accessibility on the grass. Um, the, the main issue that I would like to see addressed and I'm, and I, I guess it's technically not part of the master plan, but the special ed preschool um, is very disturbing to me. Um, uh, the fact that these students are losing um, intervention minutes because of their trip across campus to go to a playground um, should not sit well with any of us. Um, and uh, being on a play area that has three exits through which um, an eloper child can um, be uh, can be lost, um, unacceptable, um, and uh, and and the drop off and pick up is very concerning. As a preschool teacher of neurotypical children, uh, I would be hard pressed to get my kids across an entire school campus to go to a playground. Uh, so thinking about trying to get. Uh, ch children who are neurodiverse, uh, those 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 teachers and those aides are saints on this earth because that is no small feat. Thanks, um, Trustee Lieberman. So, so we'll anyway. come back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Muirhead. Thank you. Um, first of all, nice presentation, and I like the ordering that you showed, if you could send that out to the trustees, because that was much better than way I, the way I was having to scroll back and forth. So I do appreciate that, um, but nicely done. Um, I did have some a uh, couple of specific questions. Um, one was for both Bracker and Briarwood, you're showing new preschool areas, but it's not clear what happens to the old preschool areas on those campuses. So for... Um... It's a little unknown at this point. So we didn't say that we're going to demolish those portables yet because we want to find out where enrollment is at the time. So we may demolish them and then do something to make that area nice. And we'd go back to the sites and figure out what they want that area to look like, or we were leaving them. And I know that they're they're They are dilapidated buildings and they need to be potentially removed, but we wanted to keep that flexibility in the plan so that for now, if we need to leave them, we can, but our goal would be to remove them from the site. So even though they're preschool classrooms, they could be reused as something else? Yeah, they could become extended day. They could become extra pullout spaces. Um, we could put offices in them. We could, you know, figure out what to do with them based on the needs of the site at the time once the construction's done. So we figured that things may change and the climate and the student capacity may change at both of those schools by 2026 when these open. And so we wanted to leave that flexibility available. Okay. And then um, concerning Westwood, um, it's showing all these SAI classrooms up along the top of the, I don't know if that's north, but it's the top. Um, and is that where they got moved to, or is that where they were, is that where they are now after phase 1A? On, are you talking about slide, well, uh, on phase, on the it's slide, slide that's, 13. Okay, so um, that is where they are now, yes. And they're going to stay there? They will stay there throughout construction. And then yeah. um, where is their place structure going to be put? We do not have that planned yet. So there's right now, there's only three SAI preschools at Westwood. And that's something that we are discussing right now um, as to where that would be the best location for, for a structure there. But it's showing nine classrooms. Yeah, so um, those were the nine classrooms that used to be. If you go back up to slide 11 um, or the existing site plan, those 
used to all be full of SAI preschool and SAI preschool support staff. So all of the portables used to be in the middle of the campus along with an SAI preschool toilet building. And one of, or really the major request from Westwood was to get their hard courts back. And so their first project that they wanted, which we did over the summer, was to relocate all of those portables and move them to the north of the site. So currently there's only three preschools there. And over the past years, as we've been moving towards more inclusion with our preschools, we've been removing preschool classrooms and the classes from Westwood and moving them throughout the school the elementary schools around campus, around the entire district. So we've already been over the past, I would say three years, we've been diversifying and putting preschool special education classrooms at almost every school site now. And so there's not a large, there used to be basically five or six SAI preschools at Westwood. And so we've already removed some of them. And now with our lower class sizes, we had, we were planning on having two. Now with lower class sizes, we have three. Um, but we're still working through that as we are experiencing additional SAI students coming in at preschool level almost monthly. So it's something that we're still working, working around and we're working around it at other elementary schools, not just Westwood. Okay. So the plan is to leave all of those portables there for now. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're trying to figure out where to put a play structure so that they have a play structure over there. Um, and we'll just have to see if we need all of those or not. Most likely Westwood will want to keep all of them. We will be demolishing with, when the multipurpose goes in, we'll be demolishing five, what are five permanent classrooms. And so where everything- That's temporary space. Yeah, so yeah. everything that is in those classrooms will have to find another home somewhere on the campus. And so those classrooms will be some of them that'll be used. And then I know um, Ms. Gafari has been talking about how we're gonna kind of shuffle different things during construction. And where are those classrooms ending up since you're not building the two-story building yet, right? Right. So those classes will occupy, there's a few um, unused portables in that what are labeled SAI preschool. They used to be preschool classrooms. They're not anymore. So some of those functions may go in there. And then I know we're working on maybe consolidating some um, uses on different classrooms and condensing. And so we're still we're still working that plan out. But but your your um, phase one B doesn't show any new classrooms, so you're getting rid of some classrooms and not replacing them. Correct. So because um, there's currently there is some available space at Westwood to hold those um, what are in those five classrooms. They're not necessarily classes. It's um, a pullout space. There's a book room. There's other uh, okay. other things that aren't a one first grade second grade classroom. Okay. So there's most of them are support spaces. Support spaces that are just going to find other homes yeah. on the campus. So you can expand the NPR. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Thank you. And with that, we'll be looking at enrollment projections and see what comes up with that too. Sure. Thank you. Um, I would like to appreciate and show gratitude for that very thorough presentation. <laughs> Um, I know there's a lot of angst in this room right now of people who would like to speak to this item. I do have a couple of comments um, before, and I'm trying to do many things because Trustee Lieberman's not here. So I'm going to start my timer. Um, one of the things that I would had the chance to do was read Mr. Shields' email to everyone. And I wanted to, there was a point he made that I wanted to make sure was clear is that you're responsible for facilities, if I'm understanding but site administration is responsible for assigning those facilities to various teachers. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Because that's correct. Okay, because I feel like we have some miscommunication as to what the board is able to do at this meeting and what needs to be a, a further conversation, I think, between our district leadership and the site about how to allocate resources. And this goes back to something that Mr. Sheil and I have talked about that I kind of would like to expedite in a way. And that is the um, what I call some sort of a policy or about the basic um, standards for special education facilities. And that is 
for preschool class, the proximity to pick up drop off, the proximity to a playground. For a school psychologist, that's having a locked door and that can keep your um, stuff confidential. For a speech therapist, the same thing. For those of us who have to follow HIPAA, FERPA, we need to be able to have spaces that are completely confidential. Um, and so it's something that I've wanted, but it feels like we need to expedite that because there's no teeth for any of our special ed directors on making demands on following something with regards to how we place special ed personnel on a campus. And so that's something I think needs to be expedited and that's my comment. And we will now go out to the public. So I have a few, I have a few slips. So I had already um, read regarding public comment. Again, may, please make sure that the green light is on before you speak. You will have two minutes to speak. At the end of two minutes, please be kind and sit down. If there's anything you'd like to say further to the board, we're happy to read emails. So we will start with Lucas Pascal, Gabe Pascal, and Linda Pascal. Hello board members, my name is Lucas and I am a former Westwood student. I went to Westwood from kindergarten through fifth grade and every single year there's one big problem. The fact that we had no shade for PE and recess. To this day, there's still no shade and some students are having to hide under tables for shade on hot days at school. I'm, this, I'm noticing this more especially now because at my current school and there's, there's shade almost everywhere, and I can't not think how bad it is at Westwood, and they have no shade. They have installed new playgrounds, which is surely much appreciated, but they also don't have grass that they can play on, which limits the kids' playing area in some ways, but also limits the activities that they can do. My younger brother goes to Westwood currently, along with some of my friends, some other students, and many others to come. I truly hope that shade is installed before the next school year for the many students who go to and will go to Westwood. Thank you. Good evening, board members. My name is Gabe, and I'm... Good evening, board members. My name is Gabe. I am in third grade at Westwood Elementary. Please, please help us put shade on our school. It gets very hot at me. It also gets very hot at PE, and my PE is at the end of the day. When it is very hot outside, it would be also nice to finally have grass to play on. Thank you for your time. Good evening, Board of Trustees and, Super and Superintendent Waddell. And thank you, Ms. Healy, for your um, wonderful report. My name is Linda, and I am a parent of a child at Westwood Elementary School. I believe you all reviewed my email regarding issues and concerns with the Phase 1B plans at Westwood. To quickly review, my top concerns are a preschool-appropriate playground within a reasonable distance of the classroom space, shade on campus, and I will say this one is close to my heart as I've been advocating for shade at Westwood for over eight years. All we have gotten in that time are a couple of pop-up tents because of PTA donations. Number three is grass for students to play on. As you plan to move forward with phase 1B of our site plans, I would like to request more opportunities for community engagement and meetings. The last presentation we had was in November of 2022. Between the first phase and the one before you tonight, the timeline and what is included in each phase has drastically changed. We would like to know, why did these changes occur without the community's knowledge? It appears you have support from our admin, but no one in the community has been consulted or notified. The only reason any of us knew about this meeting tonight was because the construction team sent me an email. These plans concern our students and we wanna ensure we are all involved as we can be to make sure 
that this is done right for them. We're okay with proceeding with the plan tonight if these changes can be made, as we do not want to cause any further delay for this project. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. Our next two speakers are Ali Torres and Megan Fincher. Good evening. My name is Ali Torres. Um, I just wanted to say to start off, uh, my degree is in civil engineering, and I worked as a construction manager on three different educational bond programs over the years. I wanted to say that the presentation tonight and your responsiveness to emails has been much appreciated. Your communication style and detailed has just been out of bounds and so appreciated uh, by myself, and I know a lot of um, our community members. So thank you so very much for that. Um, after being a construction manager, I became a homeschooler, and we did that for a couple years there during the pandemic time, and recently joined Westwood Elementary. My kids are very proud to be Wildcats, and we joined in January. We were eager to be involved and informed and to be able to advocate for our students and the community. Um, as you heard earlier from Linda, the only reason we knew about tonight's meeting was because she had received an email from Westwood Construction at Santa Clara Unified School District.net. And she let a lot of us know about that. I was very pleased to hear about that because I did have a lot of questions. Um, I think that one thing that would be very useful for our community members would be better communication regarding the bond measure. Um, and so maybe an updated list where that Westwood construction comes like goes out to would be very helpful. Um, even though we joined in January, I do think that I probably should have been able to know that that was happening. So glad to hear that um, that's something that you guys are obviously amazing communicators. So I'm sure that will be handled. I did also want to mention um, a concern about accurate and timely information so that we would be able to respond. So we've verbally asked our administration questions regarding the projects that were completed this summer, and we were not given accurate or um, complete information, especially regarding like the seed. We were told that seed wasn't budgeted enough and so that was disappointing to us to be given false information. So we look forward to hearing information from your team as much as possible so that we can make sure we can advocate for our children. Thank you for your time. Oh, President Fairchild, can I ask staff for clarification? I thought there was a website and an email list that people could sign up for and, and go to to get information. So maybe after the public speakers are done, you can put up that information for the public so they know where they can get that information. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Both of my children attended the Westwood Special Education Preschool. This is an amazing preschool program that prepared my children for success in kindergarten and beyond. I am heartbroken about the current situation and impact on the students and teachers. I feel like this is a violation of FAPE in the Individual with Disabilities Act, as well as the Williams Act. Preschool students are currently walking over 200 yards each way to access the kindergarten playground. This can take five to 30 minutes each way, depending on behaviors. This also takes away from educational minutes and early interventions for the students with special needs. These interventions will reduce future costs for the district, but most importantly, our legal rights under their IEPs. We are failing these students by not providing the services they deserve. The kindergarten play area is also not safe or appropriate for them. The play structure is too high and some children attempt to jump. The play area is too large and has three exits where students can escape. This includes escaping into the parking lot. Students also attempt to enter kindergarten classrooms if doors are left open, interrupting those classes. The preschool students are also very loud, naturally and due to developmental and behavioral issues and disrupt the kindergarten classes. None of these problems existed when preschool had a dedicated play structure. I heard the district is working on a sensory playroom, but this is not a solution for the dedicated play structure. Many of these children need a physical play structure for IEP goals, including gross motor skills, as well as social development. Please work with the teachers to find a solution. The students urgently need an appropriate play structure in the preschool area. I also brought a picture of my daughter's class on the old playground, just to share with you guys. And if you'd like to, I could um, pass it along. Just okay. This is um, that's from 2017. Thank you.
Thank you. Those are all the slips that I have for people in the room regarding item K-1. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on item K-1? If not, I am closing public comment in the room. We will now go out to the Zoom. Are there any hands raised for item K-1? No, we have no hands raised. Okay, we'll um, take further response? comment from the board. Can I get a response? For yes. For the community. So while Michelle's work are uh, walking up, uh, we are revisiting our communication strategies. So I know Michelle's going to talk about uh, the website and how we post information on the website. Um, I will say one of the areas where I've been getting involved in the communication strategies, and Mr. Rico is not here this evening, but she and I are exploring some possibilities of how we might be able to use Parent Square as well. They have the ability to go ahead and opt into to receive messages through uh, Parent, Square, uh, Parent Square through message forums and those types of things. So uh, Mr. Rico and I are current ex currently exploring how we might be able to use that communication mechanism for Parent Square. Um, we've talked about at some point down the road, maybe we can have a QR code up on the construction site. People can do it that way, get it out onto newsletters um, through site communication. So that way we can get all of those uh, different types of communication. So we know we've been using Parent Square um, for normal school communications. So now we're seeing how we might be able to add that also to um, our construction communication. And Michelle, do you want to talk about what we've done in the past or what were the other methods we use? Sure. So there is a website for each of these projects, um, Westwood Construction, and we'll make sure that the Westwood website has a link to it. Um, the district updated all and changed platforms for the website over the summer. And so some of those old links are no longer are working. So we'll make sure that um, for all three of the projects that each of the school's websites have links directly to the um, construction website. And then on that construction website, there's a form that you can fill out to be added to the listserv. So we don't automatically add all parents that are in that community to the listserv. You have to sign up to be on it. And so um, we'll be continuing that list. And um, as construction goes, then that's how you would also get the construction updates. And I'm sure Mr. Adams and his team will also be sending Corey some um, some updates so that she can send them out when those big milestones happen with construction. So there's several ways to get access to it. We'll just make sure that they're all updated. Thank you. Um, do we have any more comments from the board? Are we ready to take action on this item? I feel like the team has heard your feedback. Um, we are planning on getting some more information back to the board regarding your concerns, hopefully next board meeting. Um, if it's unable to have next board meeting, then we'd be our first January meeting and you would be aware of that. Um, but I do, what I did hear a member of the public say was that we do need to move forward on approving this. And we need to continue talking is what I feel needs to happen. But if Trustee Muirhead, do you have further comment? Well, I just I just wanted to make sure that the issues that the community has been raising with us over the last few days, they're they um they're part of phase one A, not phase one B, and you are planning on addressing them as part of I, I don't want to approve this. And and that means that all of their concerns are not going to happen because they're not in this plan. So I want to make sure that their concerns are handled in, in either in 1A or 1B. W which one are you committing to? So 1A happened over the summer in 2023. We are proposing 1B. And then as Mr. Adams mentioned, there'll be a few phases or implementation periods of phase 1B. So we're going to plan to, and we're going to try to get those shade structures in as soon as possible at all three schools. Um, it's just going to depend on timing with DSA and getting the architect on board. And so I know he's planning on um, working with the architect to get those contracts to the board as soon as possible. And so that we're still, we're planning on doing it and we're going to move as fast as we can on the shade structures. Yeah. What about the preschool playground? The that's preschool the one I'm not playground seeing. is not in the current plan. So that's something that we're working on. And um, I think we're all going to do some brainstorming on that. I've, I've started the communication with the teachers. Um, I've been out there a few times talking to the teachers and talking also to our special education department. And we've been brainstorming on different ideas. So 
Um, I think we're still brainstorming on that and trying to figure out where would be the most appropriate location for something and what, what it would look like. And so that's still, I would say that's still in the planning section. Is there funding for it? Not, do you want to? I'm going to say, is there specific funding? We have reserves available. I'm also as, as thinking about this. I think it also might be what well, Michelle and I will need to look at. All three of us need to go look at it. Um, but I think it also might be able to be covered under developer fees um, because it is a growth in the program. Um, and that's one of the areas where developer fees can be used is when there's growth within the program. Well, so, I don't want to approve this phase 1B unless I have some sort of sense that of a commitment to to, to you have cover a, that. You have a commitment from us that we are doing everything that we can to solve this problem and we'll be bringing back an update on how to solve the problem as we move forward. Okay. I'm good with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We will go. I have some anxious board members who keep waving. Next is Trustee Lieberman. Then we will go to Trustee Canova and then we will go to Trustee Ratterman. Trustee thank Lieberman. you. Thank you, President Fairchild. Um, I actually share uh, Trustee Muirhead's concern. Uh, I, I have been struggling with whether or not I would support uh, passing the Westwood Faith 1B plan for the exact reasons that she has already stated. Um, but, and I, I, am, I just want to say that I am comfortable with the assurances from Mr. Scheel and um, Ms. Neely that um, they will be addressed. My, my main concern is the special, uh, the SAI preschool. I would like to see us address those issues with the playground um, and making sure that they have what they need to properly educate and provide services to those kids. Because uh, I 100% agree with Trustee Fairchild. Um, I would like to see us have a district standard of what is acceptable for facilities and support for special education. Um, I'd like to see that sooner rather than later. Um, and so if there is a commitment and um, there is assurances that we will have a solution to these issues at Westwood, then I will happily approve the phase 1B plan. Um, and I'm happy to hear that uh, we are going to be addressing those issues, so I will vote to approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Canova. And going back to the shade structures, when we look at the various school site plans, <clears throat> the terminology that we see referenced is metal PE shade structure. So, Larry, I assume that, I mean, because it's metal, this is a more substantial thing that's being constructed. So timelines on something like that could be perhaps a bit more significant. And so with that, is, well, number one, is that accurate? Does it take some time to put it up? Is it a bit more involved? Pro probably has to meet earthquake standards, I would assume, and things of that nature, probably wind gust and all kinds of things because it's a metal structure. So with that thought in mind, since these are um, things that could take some time because they have to be done to certain standards, safety standards, um, could we conceivably come up with some temporary shelters while that's ongoing until the permanent structures are up? Is there anything you can conceive of in terms of a temporary structure that could be a fill-in while the, while the permanent ones go up for, for shade? Even the temporary. So even temporary has to go through the same code. So there's no way to speed the process up really because of the safety code. I know. I just wanted to put that out there so that's understood that um, that's important that, that we all recognize that we have state standards that we have to comply with. And it's ultimately for the safety of the students. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Canova, for your thoughts. Trustee Ratterman. 
Yeah, to me, there's two issues here. One is the long-term strategic planning. And I think it's a remarkable job that's been done there, et cetera. The second piece is that right now we have a, we have some challenges that have popped up on phase 1A, and those need to be addressed immediately. I mean, there, I, the picture of the kids huddling under for shade was just, 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 I don't want to ever see something like that again. Um, so we've gotten a commitment, and thanks to uh, President Fairchild, she asked to have this on the agenda. I'm addressing this mostly for Pres uh, Trustee Muirhead, put on the agenda that the staff will get back to us with solutions to these problems. And I wanted to reemphasize that earlier, uh, which is why I chimed in as well. Um, and my ex expectation there, and we have a very clever, very creative staff. We're fortunate. We just have some really wonderful people working for us. I don't want to get into fixing it, whether it's temporary shush or something else. I don't know how to do that. That's what our people will do for us. They will find solutions for us. I'm confident of that. And, and by the next board meeting, I'm hoping that not only will they have found, but found and implemented and get them rolling or in process of doing it. Because every day is another day that a student is being inconvenienced or harmed or whatever synonym I'm trying to come up with. So I think it's really important that that piece recognizes its urgency. We may have to do something unusual. In the picture that was passed around, there is a 10 by 10 sage structure in that picture, okay? which I noticed uh, when I came by, it just jumped out at me. So I think there's good solutions. Hopefully you can find them, knowing that we won't have to live with them forever, but at least get them up, get it to the point where the people are, are, are coming, bringing their kids to school and feeling comfortable their kids are being treated well. The other part of this where you planned the other, the wonderful, and I feel really bad about Briarwood and uh, the other schools because we're not giving them any shift at the moment, but you've done a great job with all of it. Thank you. Move to approve the plan. Second, Rodderman. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion from members of the board? Okay. Trustee Canova. Yes. Trustee Gonzalez. Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Muirhead. Yes. Trustee Rodderman. Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent. I vote yes. Student Trustee Valdez. Yes. That passes six to zero with Trustee Ryan being absent and student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. We will now move on to action item L1, resolution 2361, continued funding application for the California State Preschool Program 2425. We have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez, a second? Second. From Trustee Rotterman. Any discussion? Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Rotterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent. I vote yes. Student Trustee Valdez? Yes. That passes six to zero with Student Trustee Valdez also voting yes and Trustee Ryan being absent. L action item L2, instructional materials adoption of fifth grade growth and development curriculum, pre beauty tots by Health Connected. Do you have a motion to approve? Move to approve. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay. We will do roll call. Tr Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Muirhead? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent. I vote yes. Student Trustee Valdez? Yes. That passes six to zero with Trustee Ryan being absent and Student Trustee Valdez also voting yes. We now have two information items. Um, we will start with M.1, the 2022-2023 CAST results report. Thank you, President Fairchild. We're pleased to share our district-wide data with you this evening. We certainly have things to be proud of, and we also have areas where we have some targeted work to do, and we are already about it. You heard some weeks ago about our math initiatives, and you'll hear later this evening the same for English language arts. We have a world-class workforce, amazing students, innovative minds, and committed hearts, while we have work to do, we are committed to rolling up our sleeves, locking arms, and doing it together. Our leadership at the district office and sites have been focused on this work, and we have incredible teachers doing the critical work with our young people each and every day. And we know that's where the rubber meets the road, and we're all here in service to that. I want to thank our data team and Chief Academic and Innovation Officer Stam for their leadership in this analysis and planning, and look forward to hearing the report this evening. 
Thank you, Dr. Riddell. Good evening, President Fairchild, trustee, student trustee Valdez, Ms. Burrell. Uh, I promise to speak quickly. Uh, we have a lot of data to cover. Um, tonight, I'll be presenting the district's 22-23 CASP data. CASP stands for the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress. Prior to sharing our CAS data, I'll share recently received data from last year on our chronic absenteeism rates and data from the LPAC assessments. LPAC stands for English Learner Proficiency Assessments for California. The data tonight presents some modest good news, as well as much that is very concerning and must serve as a catalyst for focused and determined action by everyone in the district to improve student outcomes, especially for our historically most underserved students. I'd like to thank Director of Data Assessment and Accountability, Cameron Lewis, seated to my left for his work in compiling the charts and graphs we'll review tonight. I also want to recognize the entire department's role in providing teachers, administrators, students, and families with timely and relevant data to inform their efforts to support every student's learning, well-being, and academic achievement. My presentation is focused on sharing our data, and I will only briefly outline improvement strategies tonight. As the board recalls, I presented on our math achievement improvement efforts at the September 26th board meeting. Following my presentation, Assistant Superintendent Kathy Knabel will present on our literacy achievement improvement efforts. As I've been speaking, uh, the district's vision has been projected on the screen. This represents our collective North Star, our why, what we aim to prepare all of our graduates to know and be able to do for a successful adulthood. We have an ambitious vision for our graduates and test scores capture only a partial view of this development. They're nevertheless an essential barometer of our relative success in supporting each student to gain proficiency in key standards and progress in their learning journey in pace with grade level expectations. This is the structure of the presentation, so I'll start first. I will start first with, first with chronic absenteeism data, then initial LPAC results, summative LPAC results, and then math, science, and English language arts CASP results. In conjunction with our district vision and core values, I remind us of our collective responsibility and commitment to our community to improve the achievement of all students and close opportunity gaps for those historically underserved. We do it by using data to improve adult practice and student achievement, even when it may feel uncomfortable because of what that data is telling us. We pay attention to the whole child because we know there is an inextricable link between a student's physical, mental, and social well being and their academic achievement. And we know that we must work together in teams, and our district and school site systems must function well in order to improve outcomes for every student. We begin with a look at chronic absenteeism data. This district, like much of the state, entered into our differentiated assistance after the results of the last California school dashboard, largely due to our high absenteeism rates. As a reminder, chronically absent refers to any student who has missed 10% or more of their expected days enrolled. Over the standard course of a year, this would be 18 or more days absent, including excused and unexcused absences, as well as out of school suspensions. There's much scholarship around the importance of attendance and our own internal analysis has shown strong relationships between attending school and academic performance. The district is working through a continuous improvement cycle with the county office, and we expect to see improvement in our chronic absenteeism rates on the coming 2023 California School Dashboard release this December. In the interim, the state recently re released chronic absenteeism rates via DataQuest. These rates look at chronic absenteeism across our district and vary slightly from the rates that will be shown on the dashboard. Most notably, chronic absenteeism of high school students is not reflected on the dashboard. However, they are part of the overall rates shown in the following two slides. This slide shows our chronic absenteeism rate for the district for each year beginning in 2016-17 and omitting the two pandemic years of 1920 and 2021, which will be the case for the other longitudinal data, data slides I'll show this evening. It compares our rate in navy blue with that of the state in brown and the county in teal. As you can see, we're currently even with the county at 19%, a one point decline from last year and seven to eight points higher than before the pandemic. This chart, this chart shows the percent of students chronically absent by student group. 
The green indicates an improvement, in other words, a decline in chronic absenteeism rates from 21-22 to 22-23. While we're showing declines in most of our historically underserved student groups, the rates are still very high. For example, our Hispanic Latino group showed a decline from 32 to 29%, and our students with disabilities from 33 to 31%. Compare this to our Asian group at 11% or our white group at 16%. An example of ongoing more systemic barriers to lowering these rates include an increase in month-long trips that families take to other countries. COVID protocols have contributed as well, although this has improved this year as the protocols have been relaxed somewhat. Under the leadership of Rob Griffin, staff and student services have been partnering with school sites to build capacity and implement attendance intervention strategies. Some of these strategies are well-trained attendance clerks at each school site. We hold annual attendance boot camp trainings for all clerks starting last year. The clerks are part of a team structure using weekly absentee reports and other data tracking tools to inform tiered intervention strategies. These tiered strategies address the many facets of attendance, including family and student engagement, relationships at school, behavioral and mental health, academic supports, and basic family needs. District level attendance intervention includes the attendance liaison, district social worker, social worker interns, fall and spring chronic absenteeism school site check-ins, the SST and IEP process, and the SART and SARB processes. We're proud of the systems that we put in place and the robust use of data and tiered supports. And we do expect to see continued improvement over the course of this year and beyond. Last year, we began a concerted effort to ensure all of our English learner, multilingual learner students were receiving high quality English language development. And we know that proficiency in the English language has a direct impact on a student's ability to understand academic content and effectively display that knowledge on local and state assessments. A student whose family reports that non-English languages are spoken within the home will be given the initial LPAC. This assessment is given only once in the course of a student's K-12 educational journey. Students who score an intermediate or novice English level receive an English learner designation and are then eligible to receive subsequent ELD services. These bar graphs show the initial LPAC results for elementary students who have a home language other than English and are new to the district each year. More than half of these students are classified as a novice English learner, which means they are scoring at the lowest possible tested level and will require the most intensive English language supports. It should be noted that the 21-22 and 22-23 rates were taken at the end of the year. The initial LPAC is administered throughout the entire school year, and we historically see an increase in students needing to take this exam every January. As such, our 23-24 rates will most certainly continue to climb, to rise throughout the year. And you can see the difference between 992 and 616 year to date. This shows the initial LPAC results for middle school students who have a home language other than English and new to the district. More than half of these students are categorized as novice English learner. We've seen a jump in students classified as initial fluent English proficient. However, this will change as the year is not even half over and students come in throughout the year. You can see that we're just at 27 students year to date versus 92 last year. Historically, the district receives far fewer students at the high school level needing to take the initial LPAC, as you can see by the smaller numbers. When these students are tested, they're overwhelmingly new to the country and are considered newcomers. This graph shows a 16-point increase between 21-22 and 22-23 in the percent of high school students scoring at the novice English learner level in the orange. Our current year rates appear at first to show a significant de decline in the percentage of students scoring at the novice level. However, at the time of this report, only 27 have been tested. High school in particular is one of the grades levels where we tend to see increases in new arrivals at the beginning of each calendar year. This presents a unique challenge as half of the school year will have been completed at the time of their enrollment. Assistant Superintendent Knavel will speak to some of our efforts to support newcomers and multilingual learners as part of her presentation. The summit of LPAC it is, is administered every year beginning in February to all English learner students who have yet to be reclassified as English proficients. These stacked bar graphs show the performance level of our elementary grades multilingual learners, or ELs as the state still calls them, on the summit of LPAC. 
Scores are distributed into four levels. Level one in the orange means beginning to develop. Level two in the yellow means somewhat developed. Level three in the light blue means moderately developed. And level four in the navy blue means well developed. Level four is also one of the key criteria for English learners to be eligible for reclassification to fully English proficient. In the graphs, we see a modest improvement from 17 to 19% in the number of elementary ELs at level four in 22-23. The percentage of students scoring at a level two remains consistent, while the percent of students scoring at a level one increased from 17 to 19%. These graphs show the performance level of our middle grades multilingual learners on the summit of LPAC. We see more substantial improvement from 17 to 24% in the number of students at level four. I want to acknowledge that the middle schools made increasing the number of students eligible for reclassification a priority last year. And the impact of that focused effort is borne out in the data. School staffs have seen the data and progress has been celebrated. This applies to students as well as staff, which is why we are encouraging schools to involve students in goal setting and progress monitoring of their own language and academic learning. Evidence of impact and improvement helps to create a growth mindset and a sense of efficacy that in turn motivates the will and self-confidence needed for continuous improvement. Success can breed success. These graphs show the performance level of our high school multilingual learners on the summit of LPAC. We see a rebound from 16% to 23% of students who scored at a level four. This is also attributable to focused efforts at the high school mirroring those of the middle school. I wanna recognize that the schools are rightly maintaining their focus on EL student progress, especially our long-term English learners in the secondary schools, while also expanding their attention to needed improvement in student mathematics achievement as well, which I will address next. Just a reminder that the CASP is the state assessment system that contains several statewide assessments. The Smarter Balanced Mathematics and English Language Arts CASP assessments are administered to students in grades three through eight and grade 11. There's also a California science test, also referred to as the CAST or C-A-S-T that is administered to students in grades five, eight and once during high school. I'll be sharing data on all three assessment results starting with math. I'll review the CAS math data in the next eight slides focused on overall student performance at specific grade bands and performance of our Latino students at specific grade bands. As you know, they are our largest group at 40% of the student population. At the end, <coughs> excuse me, at the end of this section, I will provide a brief recap of efforts underway and plan to improve math achievement. The graph above provides an analysis of math scores by race, race and ethnicity. District-wide, the highest percentage of students meeting and exceeding math standards in 22-23 were those identifying as Asian at 30 percentage points above the district's overall average of 47%. White students are 13 points above the district average. Our English learner multilingual learner students scored the lowest percentage meeting and exceeding math standards at 16%. That is one point higher than the county at 15% and five points higher than the state at 10%. Our Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Latinx students, whom I will refer to as Latino students for this presentation, had the lowest performance among racial ethnic groups at 19%. The same as our students with IEPs, known to the state as students with disabilities. This is two points lower than the county at 21% and four points lower than the state average for Latino students. In subsequent slides, I'll show our math achievement data broken out by grade spans for students overall and also for our Latino students. Some may ask, where does our overall CAS math data stack up with other K-12 unified di school districts in Santa Clara County? We sit four points below the county average at 51%. We're seven points above San Jose, 17 points above Gilroy. We are 15 points below Milpitas and 32 points below Palo Alto. The tables below provide detailed math results from last year, and I know it's very hard to read. I'm not, I'm not gonna go through every cell, I promise. Each cell contains the percent of students meeting and exceeding standard at the given grade level for the given student group. Each count underneath the percentage represents the number of students with scores at the met or an exceeded performance level. Please note that smaller demographic groups such as our American Indian, Alaska Native, and Pacific Islander populations have been omitted due to a lack of data availability in each school year 
as well as data privacy concerns due to low numbers. While there's a lot here to digest, I think the headline is that Latino students in our district, except for fourth grade and 11th grade, are underperforming Latino students across the county and across the state as a whole. It begs the question, what do we need to be doing differently in Santa Clara to improve the achievement of our largest student group? The next slides are by grade span, three through five, then six through eight, then grade 11, and compare overall performance in math over several years to the county and the state, and then the performance of our Latino students in math over several years to the county and the state. I will also include comparisons with a set of other districts in our county. Here you can see how our grades three through five students are performing on the CASP in math over the past seven assessments in comparison with the county and the state. We are in orange, the county is in teal, and the state is in light brown. While we saw positive progress before the pandemic from 49% in 1415 to 60% in 1819, since the pandemic, we have seen a decline to 55%. This is in contrast to the slight improvement of both the county and the state last year after their post-pandemic drops. In terms of a comparison with other districts in the county, we are in the middle. For example, there are 13 elementary union or unified districts above us and 12 below us. A few examples, in comparison with our 55%, Moreland and Mountain View Wisman are at 63%, Milpitas is at 64%. In contrast, Sunnyvale is at 51%, Campbell is at 50%, and San Jose is at 44%. I want to emphasize that each district's context and demographics are different, and it makes it very difficult for useful comparisons, particularly with overall data. I will show comparative data with these districts as well, however, for our Latino student group, which can give us insight into how well we are serving the needs of our largest student populations and how other districts are serving those needs. In this graph, you can see our Latino students in grades three through five showed improvement in the five years before the pandemic from 22% to 34%. Their performance was roughly similar to Latino students in the county and the state. The district, county, and state all showed drops of about seven to eight points after the pandemic. Our Latino students declined slightly last year from 27 to 26% meeting or exceeding standards, while the county and state both showed gains with the state now higher than the district at 28%. In terms of a comparison with other districts in the county for Latino student performance in grades three through five, we are sitting in the middle. For example, there are 12 districts above us and 12 districts below us. Above us, for example, are Moreland at 31, Mountain View, Wisman, and Campbell are the same as us at 26. Below us, San Jose at 23, Milpitas at 21, and Sunnyvale at 18%. In grades six through eight, our students overall, shown in the orange circles, had roughly flat performance for several years on the CASP in math prior to the pandemic, sitting between the county, which is above us, and the state, which is below us. At a 5% point drop post-pandemic, we currently are eight points below the county and 10 points above the state. That's overall. The performance of our Latino students in grades six through eight here in the orange circles has been consistently below both the county and the state for many years, as this graph shows. This mirrors a pattern in English language arts as well, which I will share later. This is particularly acute in the middle grades and is very troubling. In terms of a comparison with other districts in the county for Latino student performance six through eight, we are sitting near the bottom with 14%. There are 19 districts above us and only three districts with data below us. The three districts below us are Orchard, Franklin McKinley, and Alum Rock at 13 and 11%. Several of our comparison districts are not doing much better than us. San Jose, Sunnyvale, and Moreland all sit at 15% versus our 14%. Campbell is at 17, Mountain View Wispin and Milpitas are at 21. The highest ranking district in the county in this category is Los Altos at 53%. Under Dr. Waddell's leadership, we have set ambitious three-year goals to improve our Latino students' CASP achievement by 30 points in math. We are facing this challenge. We are determined to interrupt a longstanding pattern of low achievement and set our Latino students on a path towards success. For those who say it can't be done, I direct them to the data from Palo Alto Unified, where in two years, they raised the achievement of their low-income Latino students by 27 points and those of other student groups by double digits as well. 
Dr. Waddell's announced Latino Achievement Project will seek to better understand both the causes of this underperformance and to identify strategies to empower both our Latino students and our teachers and other staff to both embrace a vision of Latino success in school in Santa Clara Unified and chart a path to that vision. Dr. Jose Gonzalez, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, and Dr. Brenda Carrillo, Student Services Director, are co-leading this project with me. We will be putting the voices and perspectives of our Latino students, staff, and families at the forefront to guide our efforts. We look forward to sharing more information with the board on this project in the new year. Moving to high school, our 11th graders overall performance on the math cast shown in orange has shown slight improvement from last year to 40%. We're six points below the county, 13 points above the state. By comparison, while we were above Eastside Union at 35%, we were below Campbell at 49%. At grade 11, our Latino students' performance on the cast math has oscillated between 12 and 20% in rough alignment with the county and the state. Our latest data shows 16% meet and exceed, equivalent to the state, two points above the county. By comparison, we are above three districts in the county that serve high school students. San Jose at 12%, Eastside Union at 11 Milpitas at 10 We are have the same scores as two other districts, Gilroy and Morgan Hill, and we're below five districts, Campbell at 17, Fremont Union at 19, Mountain View at 26, Palo Alto at 38, and Los Gatos at 47, to just give a sense of the span. The board's support for Math Pathways redesign, new secondary math courses, refresher and onboarding training on the Orego math curriculum, reacquainting staff with the CAST blueprint, question types and vocabulary, the shift towards common and interim assessments. All of these strategies are embedded in a five-year math achievement improvement plan that will be finalized early next year. This plan embodies our district's focused and sustained commitment to dramatically improving math outcomes for all students, and especially for those like our Latino students whom the data show we have pretty dramatically underserved up until now. We will change that story. Now we'll turn briefly to science and the results from the California science test. This test is administered in grades five and eight and once to each student while the student's in high school. All students must take the CAS by grade 12, but have the option of testing in grade 10 or grade 11. Overall, 42% of Santa Clara students met and exceeded standards. This results is three point lower than our 21-22 results. It, has, it is also five points lower than the county average of 47. However, both district and county results are higher than that of the state, which is at 30%. This graph shows the scores by race and ethnicity. As you can see, our Asian student group performed the highest at 66%, second highest performing group of white students at 57. <clears throat> Similar to the district's ELA and math results district-wide, students identifying as English learner, multi-learner, lingual students had the lowest percentage of students meeting and exceeding science standards at 4%. This result is one point lower than the 21-22 results and the county results, which were at 5%, and two points higher than the state results, which are only at 2%. Black or African-American students have the lowest performance among racial ethnic groups at 8%. This represents a large 16-point reduction in the percentage of Black African-American students meeting or exceeding science standards. However, it should be noted that the size of the tested population went down from 18 to six students, as such caution should be used when interpreting these results. This table shows detailed results similar to the math table I showed earlier, broken down by student group and grade level. The last column is an average of all tested grade levels. Again, the headline here is the performance of our Latino students. The 17% overall meet and exceed standards represents a three point reduction from the previous year at 20% and is two points lower than the county and state average of 19%. This graph compares the last pre-pandemic CAST assessment results with the two post-pandemic results. Our results at 42% sit between the county at 47, which is in teal, and the state at 30, which is in brown, and show a decline of three points. Our Latino students' CAST results show a three-point decrease from 21-22 at 17% and are below the county and state averages, which are at 19%. 
This is generally indicative of the pattern that we're seeing in math and English language arts and just underscores the need for a focus on improving outcomes for our Latino students. Similarly to the presentation, our math results, I'll now review eight slides uh, with our English language arts data showing both overall student results and those of our Latino student group. This graph above provides an analysis of the English language arts scores by race and ethnicity. Overall, our results are at 59% meeting or exceeding standards. Our Asian student group had the highest percent meeting or exceeding at 80% following by those identifying as two or more races at 74%. Our ELML students had the lowest percentage uh, meeting and exceeding uh, ELA standards at 17%. This result remains unchanged from the previous year and is two points higher than the county at 15% and six points higher than the state at 11%. Our Latino students had the lowest performance among racial or ethnic groups at 35%. In terms of how our overall data stacks up to other K-12 unified school districts in Santa Clara County, we have the same results as the county average at 59%. We are nine points above San Jose Unified and 19 points above Gilroy. On the other end of the spectrum, we are 11 points below Milpitas and 23 points below Palo Alto. Similar to the math and science tables I showed earlier, it shows the detailed results broken down by student group and grade level. The last column is an average of all tested grade levels. I'm not gonna spend time again drilling down to this table, but I wanted to make it available to the board, the staff and the public to do so if they wish. You can see that the lower three color bands show a comparison of overall data with that of our Latino. I'm gonna try this a little funky. Okay, it's down here, these three color bands. Yes, woohoo. Show a comparison of overall data with that of our Latino student group in comparison with the county and the state. Um, across all tested grade levels, 35% of our Latino students met or exceeded standards. This is two points higher than the county and one point lower than the state. Interesting that the state's average for Latino students is higher than our county's average as well as our district. Here you can see how our grades three through five students are performing on the CASP ELA in comparison with the county and the state. We are in the navy blue, county is in teal, the state is in the light brown. While we saw positive progress before the pandemic from 52% in 1415 to 65% in 1819, since, since the pandemic, we have seen a decline to 59%. This mirrors declines in both the county and the state data post pandemic. In terms of a comparison with other districts in the county for grades three, five ELA, we are sitting in the middle, 13 districts above, 12 below. In comparison uh, to our performance at 59%, Moreland's Performance is at 65, Milpitas is at 66, Mountain View Wisman is at 69. By contrast to our 59, Sunnyvale is at 56, Campbell is at 54, and San Jose is at 49. In this graph, you can see our Latino students in grades three through five showed improvement in the five years before the pandemic from 26% to 42%. Their performance is slightly higher than Latino students in the county and the state. The district, county, and state all showed drops of seven to eight points after the pandemic. Our Latino students' results were flat this year, staying at 35% meeting or exceeding standards. The county and state students showed little to no improvement either. In terms of a comparison with other districts in the county for grades three through five Latino student performance in ELA, we're somewhat above the middle, with eight districts above and 14 below. Below our 35% are San Jose at 29, Milpitas at 27, Sunnyvale at 28, and Campbell at 33. Moreland is the same as us at 35, and Mountain View Wisman is 36. So pretty tightly bunched on th this performance band. In the middle grades, our students overall shown in the Navy circle showed improvement over the five years before the pandemic before declining slightly to 56% and remaining flat last year. We are three points below the county and 10 points over the state average. In terms of comparison with other districts, we are sitting in the middle, 13 uh, above, 13 districts above us and 12 below us. In comparison to our 56%, Mountain View Wisman is at 60, Moreland at 63, Milpitas at 73, Sunnyvale is below us at 54, Campbell at 52, and San Jose at 50%. 
The performance of our Latino students in grades six through eight on the CASP ELA, seen here in the navy blue circles, has been consistently below both the county and the state for the past decade, as this graph shows. This mirrors the pattern that we saw earlier in mathematics. In terms of a comparison with other districts in the county for Latino middle school student performance, we are sitting near the bottom with 31%. There are 16 districts above us and only six districts below us. In our chosen comparison group, Sunnyvale is below us at 28, and we are tied with San Jose, Mountain View, Wisman, Gilroy, and Campbell at 31. Above us are Moreland at 35 and Milpitas at 39. I'm almost done, hang in there. Our 11th graders performance on the CASP ELA shown in navy blue has shown slight improvement from last year from 66 to 68%. We are two points above the county and 13 points above the state. In comparison with some other county districts, we're above Eastside Union at 62% and the same as Campbell Union at 68%. Our 11th grade Latino student performance on the CASP ELA shown in navy blue has seen increases and declines in the percent of students meeting and exceeding standard over the past nine years. Our 18-19 results were at 48%. After the pandemic, we experienced a two point decline to 46 and then it has remained constant. The district's Latino 11th grade student performance is four points above the county average at 42 and the same as the state average. By comparison, we're above six districts in the county that serve high school students, San Jose, Gilroy, Campbell, Eastside, Morgan Hill, Milpitas, and below four, Fremont, Palo Alto, Mountain View, and Los Gatos, Saratoga. This is my last data slide. I'm sure everyone's brains are swimming with data points by now. As I stated at the beginning of my presentation, there's some modest good news in our data and much to be concerned about, demanding our resolve to do better by our Latino students and to improve the alignment of our instructional content and our local assessments with the key standards and the CASP blueprint. This alone will yield improvement in our results as we can feel more confident, as students can feel more confident that they are being tested on what they have been taught. Dr. Budella has set an ambitious 16.3 year goal for improvement in our CAS BLA scores and 25 points for our Latino students. I know that my colleague Kathy Knavel is ready to share our strategies to improve student ELA and ELD achievement. But first I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you, Mr. Stam. Take a good deep breath. Okay, um, as with all of our presentations, we will start with the first round of the board, and then if we have any public comment, we will go out to the public. I have received no slips to this point, and then we will come back to the board for any further comment. We'll start with Trustee Canova. So I'll start this with a story. Um, we had some new neighbors that just moved in into our community, beautiful family really excited to have them as neighbors. And we started to have a conversation and I'm selling them on the Ag News campus because that serves our neighborhood, our community. And it's a beautiful, stunning campus. But I just want you to know that parents pay attention to these numbers. Their kids go to private school. And so I'm selling them on a state-of-the-art campus. But what I kept hearing in this presentation again and again and again is the word metal, we're in the metal. We're in the middle. Is that good enough? Do we want to be in the middle? Is that something to celebrate? We should feel okay because we're in the middle with these other districts. Financially, we're known as a, a powerhouse of a district. Uh, and we show up with our uh, schools. We have state-of-the-art facilities and we're upgrading facilities. Uh, as we had a presentation earlier about those efforts and the, and the extraordinary amount of money that goes into that. And let's not forget, and, and, I, and I know it's probably annoying for many people, this board is here to represent the taxpayers who underwrite everything here, everything here, the infrastructure, the salaries, the careers, the vacations, all the wonderful, beautiful things are underwritten by the taxpayers and their only input into this is these seven seats. That's the only input they have. And I'm saying as one of seven, middle's not good enough. It's just not good enough. I have a question about the charts. I was looking at the high, high performing groups. And if I recall, I see um, Asian is by far the best. I think they're stellar. 
uh, Asian, Caucasian, I believe also Filipino, but then there was one that said two or more races, I believe. And those those four groups in the charts are the highest performing groups. But then when you look down the chart, you see a, a bar for um, economically disadvantaged. So my question is, and I'm Caucasian, if my family is economically disadvantaged and my student you're getting the data for my student's performance. Are, is that data going into the Caucasian column or is it going into the economically disadvantaged column or is it going into both columns? I'm trying to understand the relationship of that column to all the other columns. It's going into both. We combine program status and race and ethnicity into one chart for purposes of just fewer, fewer charts. But they are in there. They would be in both categories. If you're low income white, then you would be in the white column for purposes of this graph, as well as in the socioeconomically disadvantaged. Well, and I'll finish because I, I don't want to take too much time because others have things to say. But we always look at Palo Alto and their performance. But those of us, Palo Alto is a very affluent place. It's a very um, it's. It's a very expensive place to live. You know, living near the Stanford campus, the, this is a one one percent. The one percent live in and near the Stanford campus and in Palo Alto. So, irregardless of the column that you fall in, that's a very affluent community. And so, I think when we look at these things, and I think that economically disadvantaged column is a very important one to understand better, mm -hmm. because if a family is economically challenged, irregardless of what column they fall in. That is just a huge, huge albatross around the necks of that family for their students to perform. Uh, they have a much more difficult uphill battle. Um, money matters. Economics matter. And what we can do as a district that has such robust resources is we need to fill that gap for those kids. We, we need to make the difference. That's what public ed education is about. That's what it should be, that those who have not can excel and prosper in their lives. That's why we're here. So anyway, that's enough for me. Thank you, Trustee Canova, or Trustee Muirhead. Well, thank you for gathering all this data and reading it out to us. Um, I want to point out that when you have a number like 50% are meeting and exceeding standards, that means half of our kids are not. And I don't have to explain that to you. I'm just, um, it it's crazy to me. And when you have, uh, some of our numbers are like 19%, which means maybe one out of five students are meeting ex standards. And this is like the standard. This is what they're supposed to be doing coming out of a grade level. And um, I, I, I can't, I, I don't care as much how we compare to other districts. Each one of them has a different mix of kids, and you know we can we can want to be Palo Alto all we want. We we are not Palo Alto. We are Santa Clara, and we have the funding to do so much. I mean, we are better funded than just about every district in our county, and yet you are comparing these. I'm not getting on your case. This is just the numbers. So I'm I'm using you as a as a figure because you're at the podium. But we, Santa Clara Unified has these numbers that just don't reflect what our students are capable of. And and it just saddens me to see that we are not expecting more of our students and working with them harder and teaching our teachers better or whatever it is we need to do. And so I am really glad that we are, um, I feel like for the first time in years, focusing on improving educational outcomes for our students, because that is kind of the point of what we're doing here. And um, and I, I just think we need to be spending time on this because we are missing, uh, left, right, and center, we are missing with just about every student group. Um, and and I'm going to hold you to these increases that you are promising or or want want to see because this is just not acceptable for our district, the, the, the results that we're getting.
Trustee Gonzalez, then Trustee Raderman. So uh, I guess uh, I would concur with my, my fellow board members as far as uh, these are not the results we're, we're, uh, that we want or the results that we should be getting. Um, but uh, Mr. Stam, I would say, what is it that we need or what are the resources? Or what, what is it that you might um, find? Uh, I know we've done innovative things here as far as, uh, you know, free busing for our students before we were charging a minimum amount, but it was still an amount uh, to get our students from what, like El Viso to, to Wilcox and certain places that were a little bit far reaching when we didn't have in Donald High School. We did things that, that districts like Long Beach have done where, you know, we're free SATs, tests, free uh, AP tests, things that we want to make sure that there's no barriers for our students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged or, or otherwise, um, you know, look uh, look forward to taking some of these things. And, you know, our race for AP testing have increased. But what, is there anything that, uh, and I know I mentioned, you know, um, our system's perfectly uh, set up to give us the results that we're getting, right? So. I know that we're looking at changing things and uh, is there anything that you need from our board that resources or, or some other, something else that, that we can do to, to, to mitigate some of these uh, numbers because they are abysmal, they're, they're not where we wanna be and we wanna make sure that we, uh, we do right for our students um, and meet them wherever they're at. We understand that, you know, our, 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 our teachers, our, our staff are doing things, you know, but we do have, you know, whether it's academic counselors, whether it's wellness counselors, we have more resources that our teachers can direct our students, um, whether it's sort of the family resource center, there's things that we've in instituted to, to help the whole child, right? So um, is there any one thing or what things that, that you need from our, our board or from, from us to, to get this moving? Well, I appreciate the question, and we are putting together multi-year plans to improve math and ELA, ELD student achievement, um, and I think the request will come along with those plans once we get a sense of what the resources are. We're also going out and asking students, in particular our Latino, Latina students, what they need, um, what's not working for them in our district, um, and I think we need to take a hard look Frankly, if we're getting these type of results in our middle grades with our Latino students, take a hard look at the design of our middle schools, the design of the day, some of the larger structures that we're trying to fit everything into. Um, we're do we're doing some really good pathway work now in in math, um, in in middle school and in high school, and I think we we have an opportunity to take a step back and take a look at. We've, we've ha had things organized. We've had the day, the week, the year organized in the same way for a long time, and we've been getting the same results for a long time. So let's take a look at some of the more structural and systemic issues as well. And absolutely, greater alignment with the CASP test blueprint, absolutely. Common assessments, absolutely. Those are, um, you know, those are the easier things to do in some ways. Um, but I think Taking asking the students um, what what they need to be successful, I think, is something that we really want to do as part of this achievement project, and we'll look forward to sharing back with the board um, what the students have to say as well, um, as well as some more um, resource priorities. And I I would add to to what Mr. Sam said. I, I think the many of the things you've heard recently, the the work around mathematics, the both the pathways as well as the the short and long term movement, the work with our liter elementary literacy project, which is where we know that a strong literacy foundation begins. Those are all going to produce things that we expect to be bringing back to you and saying this is what we need to do. The Latino uh, achievement project is. Uh, is front and center of the work. And while that's still in the design process, it is going to be cent centered on l listening to the voices of students and communities around what made a difference, what would have made a difference, what would have gotten you there. Um, and Because we know that that the really truth resides there and we're going to be planning and bringing, bringing things forward as a consequence of that. Thank you, Trustee Raderman. Yes. Um, first off, thank you for a very comprehensive 
candid. I really appreciate the candor. I know that some of the stuff's got to be hard for you to sit up here and talk about. I look at that. I've been on this board a very long time, and I look at this as a personal failure. It isn't just what's happening right now. Since I've been on the board, these numbers have been playing in this range. Um, and so I will tell you that one of the things I'm very, very excited about right now is I'm thrilled about it. We have a superintendent that's had the courage and the vision to set aggressive goals. These are very aggressive goals, and he's going to pay a price for that. There's people that are going to push back on him for that. And he's, get, and he's made the commitment to succeed. And, you know, I know there's going to be skeptics. There's going to be people out there that push back and say the goals are unachievable and we can't do that. But, you know, history is filled with people that have gone out and said, I'm going to do the impossible and succeeded because they believed in it. They believed it could be done and they could make it happen. Think back to um, the four minute mile. When Roger, St Roger Barrister broke that, that, that record in 1954, it had held since 1880 something. He finally broke the four minute mile. Guess what? 30 days later, John Landry broke it again after decades and decades of nobody being able to get past it. So I remember there's actually a book by some Taylor Wharton um, scholars out there. It's, it's the power of the impossible thinking. And so I am very excited that we have the leadership. You've got skills that are just fantastic as well as the rest of our people. If we get behind this and say, we're going to do it, we're going to make it happen and nothing's going to get in our way. We will succeed. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go out to. Yeah, uh, well, Tressie Lieberman hasn't spoken and I haven't spoken. So we're going to let us do go and then we'll see if there's any comments from the room and then we'll come back to us as I stated earlier. OK, Tressie Lieberman. Thank you, President Fairchild. Um, Thank you, Mr. Stam, for your uh, presentation. Um, I I hate to be negative because I I respect you and your staff and and everyone that 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 works so hard for our kids. Um, but I I this is not 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 good. Uh, I went back and looked at our 2018 2019. Um, overall performance for ELA and math. And um, we were 62% in ELA in 2018, 19, and now we're 59. And in math, we were 52% and now we're 47. So we're going the wrong direction. Um, and I, I, to me, that very makes it very clear that whatever we're doing is not working. Um, I, I don't know if it's curriculum, I don't know if it's uh, training or implementation or, or what it is, but something we're doing is not working. Um, I, I, I know we talk a lot about looking at middle school and high school, but honestly, I, I really feel like we need to be looking at elementary school. Kids learn habits, they learn, they, they develop, um, preferences and um, dislikes of subjects and it, early on. And once they get to middle school, those things are set. I mean, they're set. Uh, and it's very difficult to break that. Uh, I know because I've got one at home that um, hates math. Um, so, and she's in sixth grade. Um, her habits are very set. I really think we need to look at elementary school and how we, what that curriculum is, how it's presented and, and how it's, it's implemented. Um, clearly the curriculum, there's, there's something not aligned to testing or something. We need to fix that because what we're doing in ELA and math is not working. Maybe it's not culturally inclusive. It's not reflective of our population. Um, and I know it's not aligned to testing. Um, so I really hope we take a look, close look, particularly in ELA at our curriculum, because I honestly just, it, it's not, it's not doing it. Um, and I, I hate having to be negative because I know you all work so hard, but these are our kids. We're here as Trustee Canova says all the time. 
we are here in service of our kids. And if it's not working, we need to do something else. So I hope we hear more about new plans to address these numbers because it's, it's, this isn't doing it. Thank you, Trustee Lieberman. Um, so in January, 2023, we went over a very similar data report and with very similar comments from the board. I know because I went back and listened um, before this meeting. And I wanna just reiterate some of the things that my colleague said at that meeting. Um, Trustee Canova, this board makes decisions that are tremendously expensive. For the money we spend as a district, we should be knocking this out of the park. This is very disappointing. Trustee Ratterman, we have a lot of an opportunity to improve our scores and we are doing things to set ourselves up for that, but we need to do more. And we need to make sure that these things occur. They have to happen. Trustee Muirhead, we should not be <laughs> happy with the middle. Whatever we can do to accelerate this process, we want our kids to be educated. Trustee Ryan, to look at where we are, even with other districts in our county, it feels like we are not keeping up. And I am looking forward to seeing our numbers increase. When we have students not meeting standards, it's concerning. Trustee Gonzalez, the system that we have in place is perfectly situated to the results we're getting. Again, I do sense a sense of urgency from this board. One year that we lose, is a big chunk of the years of our students' lives in school. How do we spend those funds to help students today? The disappointing thing to me is after this meeting, I don't know if I was the person was sent to talk to me, but um, sometimes that happens. And they they made the point that we really weren't that bad. We weren't that, we're only two points below. And that's really not that statistically different. And I left that conversation, person probably didn't know, very angry that we were okay with where we are. I think everyone in this room should be horrified with where we are and have that sense of urgency to do something about it. Now this board gave a mandate through throughout this uh, in January, we reiterated that in August. And we're asking people to say, okay, it's not okay. And what you said in your, your um, it, it hit me, doctor, and I always want to say doctors, don't you love that? Mr. Stam, you asked, what are we going to do differently? If our, if our system is set up to get the results we're doing and we keep, keep getting the same results, what are we going to do differently? And we have to have the courage to look at ourselves and do something differently. And if we're not willing to do that, then we need to find people who will. Um, so with the board has now done ARC round. Um, I have no slips from the public, but I'd like to open up public comment if there's anyone who would like to speak. Okay, we have one member of the public who would like to speak in the room. I thank all the responsible people here for being excited to do something about desperately bad news. And I congratulate you for thinking hard about all the ways that the school system can be better. I want to say that our Santa Clara Science Science of Reading Coalition is ready to help any of you who want to reach out to families and children before they arrive at school. Because it's very clear that the Hispanic kids have the most problem in reading English 
because they're very likely coming from families where the spoken language is at home, is Spanish, and it, they are from the economically disadvantaged group as well. They may not have books in the home. They may not go to the library. They don't realize that the library has got a section of kids' books in Spanish. They may not be readers themselves. And so we are interested as concerned residents of Santa Clara to help you in any way you reach out to us, and I'm sort of the point person, so you've got my email and my phone number, to say, we would like help with X. And to give you an example, we know that there are sites near us where health care organizations collect books so that doctors, pediatricians can give books to mothers. And if you're interested, I will send you a terrific video from a six month well child visit. Thank you. Are there any hands raised in the Zoom? Mm -hmm. I will close public comment. Uh, Trustee Muirhead, you had wanted to say something. Well, I just had a question, um, and I, I don't know if you have any answer to this, but it, it seems like for a number of the areas of testing, um, test scores go down uh, through the middle school years and sometimes even into the high school years. And I'm just wondering if you've, if you've, if you or any of the staff have, have looked further into that to see, is it that the kids just aren't bothering or is it that they're really not learning it or, or, um, you know, what is it that's going on that, you know, they might've been doing just fine and then they hit middle school and it kind of falls apart for many. That's a, a big area of focus for our student interviews and focus groups is that transition from elementary to middle school to figure out what is happening um, and also where are students feeling like they are having success um, in, in our middle schools and why as well because we want to learn the, the from the variety of student experiences and stories around that. I mean it is true frankly that the CASP it has no consequence for the individual student uh, and um, so Motivating students to do their best on the CASP is something that we also have to look into, um, as well as ensuring that instruction is aligned with the, what the CASP is assessing um, so that we can get a sense of how well the students are learning those key standards. Um, so it's a, there are multiple factors that go into this and we are not, this is not happening just in Santa Clara. This is a phenomenon that's happening across the state, um, but our, our decline is steeper than um, other districts and the state. And so we need to look into why that is happening. And I wonder if you've broken it out at all by school to see, are there some schools, I mean, each of our schools has different demographics, but are any of our schools doing a better job than others at the middle school and high school level, you know, and sort of dive in a little deeper as to, well, what are they doing that others could do? It, it would be interesting. I don't know if you were planning on reporting back, but it would be interesting to hear um, more about what you find with talking to students and staff at that level. Trustee Canova. And, and thank you for the presentation. And, and it, I, I always admire that you're very steady as you get the criticism from the board, but it's not at you. It's, it's at the results, it's at the statistics that we're all upset with. Um, and, and just, you know, it's always nice to frame it this way. The, the proper, our organizational chart, at the top of the organizational chart is not our superintendent, it's a community. They're at the top of the organizational chart. And as we go down the organizational chart, then it's these seven seats. And we only have one employee, we only hire one person. And I'm staring at that one person right now. That's the person that we hire. That's the only employee that we are involved with bringing on. And we have, I believe, expressed quite clearly what we expect. 
and I like what I'm hearing, but because of the it's, it's important for us to understand the organizational chart, it's not going to be us going beyond anyone other than our only employee to implement what we as a group want to see occur in this district. And I just want to make that super clear because sometimes it's, it's misunderstood. You know, we hire one person and he's a very lovely man, but um, but our expectations are with our superintendent and, and that's that needs to be clearly understood. Yeah, and I, I just do want to say that um, I, I'm inspired by Dr. Waddell's ambitious goals and his focus on our Latino student group. Um, I do take responsibility for the status quo, and I hope every other employee of Santa Clara Unified takes some responsibility as well, because it's going to take all of us to work to change the situation. And I hope that we are willing to take some risks and embrace innovation, because we need to innovate. Uh, we need to try some new strategies to get some different results. Thank you, uh, Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you, and um, I guess one of the things I was gonna mention, uh, when I got on the board, uh, there was a couple of Title I schools that at that, po at the, that point, um, the API was the, the, big, uh, the big thing, and, and getting to 800 was uh, at a certain, by a certain um, d date or year was important. But two of our more challenging schools, more challenging demographic, you know, learners, such as only disadvantaged students, were doing well, had already achieved 800 and were doing well. So it, this is not like something that we can't do. We, we can, whether it's differentiation, whether it's phonics, whether it's things that we can, we know that should should work and do work. And we have other districts, whether it's Sanger and, you know, other, some of these other districts that are, have very, I would say much, sometimes much, much more challenging demographics than we do. Are doing things that uh that we we could say are are, are amazing sometimes maybe uh are you know are pushing the uh, the envelope so mm -hmm. there's things that, that we can do to to make sure that we can do that when we started the uh, labor management initiative uh, about eight years ago and I just happened to be president I, I didn't it was it, it was a, no uh, it was not me that that pushed it but it was one of our our uh, association presidents. Um, it, it was it was not only to benefit adults in the room, but to really benefit the, the students. Find ways that we can, you know, utilize the the challenges of uh, of management to make sure that we address the the needs of our students. So, um, you know, whether we find ways of, of getting more minutes in in the classroom, whether it's more days, find ways that we we can work with uh, with our different. Uh, partners to make sure that we can find ways to get this done. Um, you know, getting our students to read by third grade. I mean, obviously that's important. I, I know our, when I got here, the superintendent that was here mentioned, you know, you're learning to read and then you're reading to learn. And if you're not reading by a certain age, you know, obviously you're not going to be learning. So we, we understand what we need to do. Just a matter of how we get there. And I think, I think we have tools, you know, much more tools in other districts to make sure that we can do it. And I, and I know we can, and I know we will, and it's just a matter of getting it done. Thank you, Trustee Lieberman. Thank you, President Fairchild. Um, one of the things about the cap that, that bothers me is that an entire year goes by between receipt of data. So that is an entire year loss without any knowledge of how kids are performing. I, I really, and I know we've talked about this before, but we really need interim assessment. We, we really need to have periodic check-ins with kids to, to gauge how successful we are with what we're teaching them. Um, we can't let a year go by before we we take a look and put you know pull the dipstick out of the engine and say you know how are we doing um so i really hope that we're pushing forward on that um and you know i i i've been attending the the literacy work group meetings with uh president fairchild and um 
one of the things that that disturbed me, and I'm sure this will come up in the next presentation, but by the time kids get to third grade in ELA, um, you know, they're not, there are no further units of study for phonics in our curriculum. So you, if, if your child is in third grade and they're not at grade level, they're, you, how are you supposed to rescue that child? Um, so I feel like we really need to in our curriculum, figure out a whole pattern. And I, I know we don't like to look at other districts. We don't like to compare ourselves to other districts. But there are districts that are doing something right. And yes, their populations may be different, but they're still getting results that we're not. So I feel like while we don't want to necessarily copy other people, why reinvent the wheel? Why don't we look at other districts and say, what are you doing that's working? Maybe we can implement some form of that. I, I, I feel like any time um, we talk about Palo Alto or um, Los Altos or whatever, there's this knee-jerk reaction of, but yeah, but they're Palo Alto. Yeah, they're Palo Alto, but they're doing something right. So, you know, can we try to find out what works elsewhere? Um, I know Milpitas is doing great things. So I, I just want to see us have the courage to say, you know what? We're not doing this right. And right. Um, and, and, and I think Chesty Fairchild made, made that point earlier. We, we need to have people that, that are working for kids that have that courage to say, this is not working. This is not acceptable. We're going to fix it. And if that means I say what I've done is wrong, then more power to you. We respect that. Go fix it. And I, I, I think that that is what this is going to take. So um, I look forward to hearing more about how we're going to address this going forward in future presentations. Thank you. I apologize. I haven't been great at doing the timer because I'm doing everything tonight. So sorry, Tressie Muirhead. I'm trying. Okay. I don't have a helper. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I... We are about six months away from a cast test and a year away from another presentation. I don't want to, in a year, pull out the comments from last year and say, let me read these again. That's not acceptable to me. I would like to concur, concur with um, Tressy Lieberman. I did have a, I had a fascinating conversation with someone from Palo Alto and who will remain nameless for their requests about how they revamped a lot of things and they took a real hard look at themselves because while they were at the top of the state and most of the categories that are high for us, they were actually close to the bottom of the state with their Latinx and economically disadvantaged. And they said that must change. And so they took a hard look at themselves and they revamped their um, English language arts pro program. They have a, um, you can go on their website, it's every student reads. And it was hard. It was hard on the teachers. It was hard on the staff. There was a lot of resistance, but they decided the students were more important than their egos. And I, I think we need to decide our students are more important. And I, I think we all, we all believe that, but we all have to decide, okay, so in a year, are we going to bring test data? And this goes from everyone in our system. Is the test data going to come and poor Mr. Sam's going to have to present it? Is it going to be the same? Is it okay for the teachers, the paras, everyone? Is it okay for you, for us to have the same data? Or are we going to say, gosh, what can I do differently in my classroom? What can I do differently when I work with a student? What do I know about what best practices say about teaching reading, about teaching math? And can I do that? 
Or are we just going to be like, well, we're in the middle of the road. That's okay. Um, I think we're better than that. And I think we're going to have the courage to really look and say and learn from other people who have made some drastic changes and have seen great results. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the board? All right. Thank you, Mr. Sam. We will now go to M2, ELA, ELD Achievement. Thank you, President Fairchild. We recently heard about many initiatives underway this year to impact mathematics achievement. This evening, we're pleased to share a, the partner or companion report to that around English language arts. Assistant Superintendent Knavel and the Ed Services team have been hard at work thinking both long-term and near-term about these things and knowing that we can't wait to begin to reach and teach every child. So we look forward to hearing the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Waddell. Good evening, President Fairchild, trustees, student trustee Valdez, and Ms. Burrell. I'm here to share this presentation with you. I cannot tell you that it's only 10 slides. I apologize, but it's a few more than that. That um, was taken out of board policy. I know. Okay. Uh, you will see that this ELA presentation closely mirrors the math presentation that Mr. Stam shared with you in September. So I'm going to go through these because I know you've seen them tonight, but I will what I will say about this um, is that we not only have a graduate por portrait, but we also have an adult portrait and a system portrait. And we have to keep in mind that this is a very large systemic change and it will take all of us, all the adults, all the student voices, and all of us in the room to make this change. Here is our commitment statement that you saw um, in Mr. Stam's presentation. And this is our guiding commitment to make all of this happen. So similar to the math goals that you saw in September, here is our baseline and very ambitious three-year goal for ELA. And as you just saw in the data presentation, depending on grade, our grade level spans, we hover slightly above, right at, or below the state and county, and we can do better. So this diagram is a visualization of the structure of the California State Framework for ELA and ELD. And this is also known to some affectionately as the turtle, right? <laughs> uh, centering the framework in the very center, you see the California, California Common Core standards and the ELA literacy within its four strands, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, and language, as well as our ELD standards. Notice that the framework calls out these standards are not just for English, but for all disciplines, which will become important later in this presentation. Moving out from the standards in the blue circles are the key themes of the standards, meaning making, language development, effective expression, content knowledge, and foundational skills. These themes highlight the interconnectedness among the strands that the Common Core standards and parts of the ELD standards contain. The white field represents the context in which instruction occurs. The framework asserts that the context for learning should be integrated, motivating, engaging, respectful, and intellectually challenging for all students. And finally, the outer circle represents the overarching goals that by the time California students complete high school, they have developed the readiness for college or careers and civic life, attain the capacities of literate individuals, become broadly literate, and acquire the skills for living and learning in the 21st century. Now I will move to how all of this is measured, the CASP ELA assessment. 
And this is important. I know you just saw our cast re results, but this is really important for us to take a look at. So these are the CASP ELA literacy assessment claims. So you can see there are assertions for reading, writing, speaking, and listening, and research and inquiry. Another important thing to see is that on that, um, on our CASP ELA literacy, the chart shows the percentage breakdown of the total items on the ELA CASP. I wanna point out that this is for the multiple choice section of the CASP. So you'll notice that writing says 15%. Writing is also measured in the writing performance-based assessment or writing task within the program. So this specifically is only talking about the multiple choice part of the CASP. This is important information when considering essential standards and the balance of instruction in these four areas in every classroom no matter the content area. So this slide may look familiar to you. It was in our math presentation. And just as Mr. Stam said then, we are not here tonight to assign blame or point fingers, but there are a lot of reasons for how we got to this point. Our teachers, administrators, parents, and students are all doing the best with their current circumstances and resources. And we have many examples of extraordinary teaching and learning taking place all over the district. But we absolutely need a robust and systemic approach to substantial improvement, improve student achievement in literacy, especially for our historically underserved students. And you can see on this slide each critical element of that approach. This approach takes time to implement, but there are concrete actions we began to implement for literacy in our R3 learning recovery plan and continue to add to this plan and plans to go forward. And I will go into more detail about the work and plans in the next slides. And you can see there, it, there is one um, structure, one thing, one key driver that I did add uh, that we've been talking about as we've been working on the math plan and starting to work on the ELA plan. And that is the last one where schedules and structures that support equitable access to learning are very important. One of those changes that, we, that you just recently approved for us is our math pathways. That is a structure that will help us achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve. So I'm first gonna focus on the actions we will take at the elementary level and then shift to the secondary level. But it's important for us to include early learning and extended learning as those are opportunities to impact achievement beyond our traditional school day. As a note, actions that you see on each slide that are in black, that are not bold, are those that began and continue to be refined since, we, since our R3 plan in 2021-2022. Some will be bolded and those are items that we started this year. And actions that you see in blue are enhancements for implementation in the future. And it will be important for us to make sure that there is coherence with the implementation of the math, the plans for math, ELA, literacy, our ELD, um, our EL steering committee has been working really hard on our EL master plan. All of those have to have coherence in our system in order for improvement to happen. So let's start with early learning. We have the opportunity to begin a child's educational journey for those that we have in our early learning programs. And it is our charge to ensure that each one of them are ready for success in kindergarten. We currently have 50 early learning classrooms, which include full and half-day state preschools, fee-based preschools, special education school preschools, inclusion preschools, and 18 traditional kindergarten this year with two more years of growth in TK on the way over the next two years. What you see here in the first four bullets is what we have had in place for our learning programs and with the recent change in TK addressing the preschool learning foundations instead of kinder standards, we continue to align our programs 
to prepare all students for kindergarten and train our teachers on early learning best practices. In the blue, our next steps is to really make sure that our students are met where they are as they enter TK and kinder and to create a protocol for transitions. Right now, our preschool teachers and um, TK teachers are collecting so much assessment data on our students, and we wanna make sure that that assessment data is useful as they move into kindergarten or move from preschool to, to TK so that teachers in TK and kinder can get started right where students are and leave the earlier um, pre-K grades. As I now move to elementary, I want to remind you that actions that you see on the slide that are in black, you're gonna see this more in the, in the elementary section. Uh, we have been implementing in the last few years since our uh, R3 learning recovery plan. And those in bold are for the ones that we started this current year. Anything you see in blue are the plans currently under development for implementation um, as we work with our math and ELA plan. So um, we want to ensure that every student can read to learn on grade level. We recognize that our curriculum supported some pieces for, from our literacy framework more heavily than others. So beginning in 2021, 2022, we heavily augmented our pacing guide to include instructional resources to better support students, such as interactive read alouds, interactive video alouds, shared reading and shared writing. We also recognize that our curriculum and instructional practices were not meeting the needs of our students who struggle with foundational skills such as phonemic awareness and decoding. Our ELA TOSAs spent the 2021-2022 year completing an intense foundational skills training, and we, want, we launched a foundational literacy training for K2 and SAI teachers during, the, during this last year and this year. The training has instructional coaching embedded to facilitate transfer of new practices to the classroom. The literacy work group you'll see is in bold. That's because we started that this year. And I'm going to um, dig a little bit deeper into the work we're doing there because that is one of the groups that's really going to help us make change. So here's the purpose of our work group. We are very fortunate to have Lori Musso, a literacy expert who has served on state literacy committees, such as the framework committee, as our facilitator in this work to keep us focused on data and research to drive our decision making. This is the makeup of the committee and has a broad range of representation across sites and grade levels. The participants were selected through an application process in order to make sure the participants were committed to attending all of the sessions and to be a spokesperson for their site or interest group. Six members of this work group volunteered to also be on the planning team to build agendas and give feedback on structure and content of the meetings. And thank you to um, President Fairchild and Trustee Lieberman for also joining us on that committee. So here's the process that the committee is following with the guidance of our facilitator. Having a defined process was important to the group in order to keep us on track to make recommendations to the superintendent this spring. You can see that we started with the turtle diagram that you saw earlier and two very important research-based documents that visualize the components of reading, Shufflebine's literacy framework and Scarborough's reading rope. Both of these you will find in the appendix of the presentation. Last week, the work group spent time digging into data and began looking at research, which we will continue at our next meeting. This is a very intense and important work that takes time and focus. So I wanna thank each member of our work group for courageously stepping into the learning and conversations that happen and will continue to happen. They are not easy. 
and we are working very hard to work together to have those conversations. As we land on some data-informed recommendations, hopefully early this spring, we will be able to focus on implementation as soon as the fall and perhaps even in the summer. We have additional opportunities to support our students in their academic achievement during our expanded learning time. So, as you know, we have always had a strong district aftercare program, as well as our ACES programs with YMCA and Boys and Girls Club. With the implementation this year of ELOP, we have also added Right at School. All of our expanded learning programs implement these common best practices that you see here on this slide that support ELA and ELD development and math as well. We have some of our students for three additional hours a day and each have these supports built into their programming. Going forward, we hope to develop tighter alignment across the programs to ensure that whichever program a child is in, that they are receiving the highest support possible. With regard to K-5 assessments, our current assessments beyond CASP are the iReady ELA diagnostic and the benchmark assessment by FMP. As you heard in the math presentation, new this year are the data literacy modules from our DAA department, which are intended to help teachers analyze their students' reading achievement all in one place. Going forward in the blue, there is a plan to consider the broad range of benchmark assessments that are available to us and to assess the usefulness of the ones we're currently using and see if there are others that would better inform instruction for teachers. For many years in this district, we had a writing performance-based assessment and prior to the pandemic had begun to revise them. With COVID, that sort of went by the wayside. So the plan is to begin that work again and to make sure that our PBAs are aligned to expectations in CASP. As previously mentioned, we have a K-2 foundational skills cohort running that is training K-2 classroom teachers and SAI teachers, intervention teachers, and instructional coaches. The training focuses on language comprehension, phonemic awareness, and phonics. We also began a paraeducator academy where 25 paras who signed up received two days of training in phonemic awareness and phonics and two days of training in language development. Sonday is our curriculum for students with, whose IEPs indicate additional reading support from our special education teachers. The Sonday system offers structured, systematic, multi-sensory reading intervention. We continue to offer Sunday training to both teachers and paraeducators. We know professional learning needs, coaching and continuous support are important to transfer into practice. So our instructional coaches are working along with our content doses to support best practices in the classroom. We are currently developing a series of courses for three, five teachers. The first of which will focus on advanced phonics, fluency and morphology that we will launch next year. So supplemental supports, our instructional framework outlines small group instruction within the classroom. And last year we revamped our tiered literacy intervention to address the needs of first and second graders who are far below grade level. The new structure is equity based with intervention teams attending to the schools whose students have the highest need first. This includes both small group and one-on-one -on -one foundational skills, and the team also pushes into the classroom to work with students and teachers to support their learning. Beginning last summer, we began to offer more focused literacy supports. We prioritized our students with highest needs. The program is designed to provide students who are approaching grade level with additional instructional time to accelerate literacy and language development. Students work on foundational literacy, and comprehension skills and how to apply those skills to their reading, writing, speaking, and listening. This coming summer, we will also connect our summer programs with ELOP summer programs so students have that opportunity to have 
a longer day, and additional supports. This slide is a K-12 slide, and you heard um, Mr. Stam talk about all of the, the things that we were doing to support our English language um, and multilingual learners um, in his presentation, but I'll just quickly go through this. So last year was a year focused on our ELML students, guided by our EL master plan. And the slide, this slide encompasses our work K-12. With our focus on designated ELD, we adopted a new curriculum. We restructured designated ELD schedules at the secondary. We standardized 30 minutes of designated ELD at elementary, and we created a secondary placement matrix. Our district-wide professional learning was focused on best practices for meeting the needs of ELML and ev at every grade level. And it also included LPAC. You heard Mr. Sam talk about our LPAC assessment. It also included LPAC domain and test type training for teachers. Our instructional coaches supported teachers by co-planning, intentional scaffolds across the content area for integrated ELD, had coaching conversations and modeled and co-taught lessons in designated ELD classrooms. And this year we established multilingual learner oversight committees, MLOCs, at each secondary site to monitor EL and our redesignated um, fluent English proficient students, as well as our newcomer students to ensure that appropriate supports were being provided. One thing that I really want to highlight, our counseling department, led by Amy Heron, our lead counsel, counselor, launched some tier two supports for secondary newcomers that um, we are finding to be very valuable based on student voice. These include student ambassadors, counselor check-ins, and home language informational supports. Things we are considering as potential areas of need going forward are additional classroom supports in, in our English learner classrooms and best practices for our LTELs, which is long-term English learners. And now I'm gonna move on to secondary. So the importance of supporting continued student growth in English language arts beginning at the transition to middle school cannot be overstated. We saw the middle school. We know we need to focus there. We need to support our teachers and our students in um, obtaining uh, better ELA outcomes. As you saw from the turtle diagram, it is essential that elements of literacy instruction are focused in every secondary classroom and every content area. We have some incredible instructional practices happening in some of our classrooms. And I really just wanna name a few knowing that there are many are, others are out there. Across the district in English, our teachers are working to, they worked and you approved board adopted literature that reflects diversity so that our students can see themselves in the curriculum that they're reading. English teachers have a curriculum map and scope and sequence and are updating their literacy toolkit. History teachers use document-based questions that focus on primary sources. Our science and English teachers use a claim evidence analysis process for writing. We have AVID high school classes and school-wide AVID strategies at some school. And our CTE teachers align their content materials with industry standard expectations of high lexile reading levels. So this is not an English only thing. And we have all of this going on and yet our scores still show what they show. So if you think back to slide seven and the four areas of literacy on the CASP, it is very important to start to unpack with teachers in each content area and see what gaps are and what teachers need to close those gaps in literacy instruction across the content area. This year, our data and assessment department is leading a secondary work group because we know, as we heard from our trustee Lieberman, that really we need to be focused on what are our assessments and how can those inform what we're doing. 
So uh, our DAA department is leading a secondary work group along with um, presenting the new data literacy model so that teachers can dig into their student data. Going forward, you'll see that we have plans to create resources for our secondary teachers to support them in understanding what is being asked of students on the CASP. And also to recommend the use of the CASP interim assessments and CASP aligned writing tasks and rubrics for six through 12. We have trained secondary teachers in Sande and will continue to offer trainings in the future. We have started familiarizing teachers with the CAS blueprint and pr prompt structures. And in fact, we have a training happening on uh, the 29th of this month with our uh, middle school English teachers who will be looking at the CAS test blueprints and vocabulary prompt structures um, to get familiar with, with what students will be asked to do on that. And, and next up for us is to plan and provide professional learning on literacy in the content areas, as well as provide calibration sessions for our performance-based assessments. In the area of supplemental supports, there are currently many options for supplemental supports in secondary. You can see this list, but the challenge is ensuring that we have a comprehensive coordinated and equitable approach to the use of these supplemental uh, supports that we are not waiting for students to use them, that we are actually actively engaging them in providing this as a next step for them. This slide may also look familiar to you and it closely mirrors the one from the math presentation but it also reinforces the need for a comprehensive systems approach to improving our literacy outcomes for all students. This is a high level simplified design of our literacy assessment system with three main categories, formative, interim, and summative. And as you can see, they all play an important role and have distinct purposes. We had a slide like this in the math as well, so that you can see that we're trying to really align our assessment processes in order to give that feedback that doesn't wait a whole year to get CASP results. So finally, as with any initiative or improvement effort, it is critical to evaluate our implementation and impact. The next steps will be to work with certificated classified and management staff to finalize the math implementation plan and then determine how the literacy plan can complement the math so as not to overwhelm the system and the people in it and from the perspective of a multi-tiered systems of support framework. Finally, I also want to thank Dr. Waddell for pushing us to set very ambitious goals and know with our partnership with our management team, UTSC, CSEA, and especially with our students, we can realize them. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Kenable. Um, we will follow the format we do with all of our presentations. We'll start with board comment and then we'll go out to any comments in the room. Um, do any of our trustee Gonzalez, you great. Well, thank you for the presentation. I, I know it's uh, in depth and uh, it, uh, I'm sure it was a lot of work from our staff and, and everybody involved. Um, so I just wrote down a few things. Um, last week, uh, I attended and I, I got to listen to it again, but the uh, California Reading Summit and it was some interesting things. Somebody in the chat just put, um, and I don't remember, I'm paraphrasing, dump FNP. I mean, there's certain things that people are looking at, right? And, and trying to understand what um, we need to do and what we should be doing. So as we look at that, um, one of the things that I've mentioned before up here, and I think other, fo other folks have mentioned, we obviously have IEPs for our special ed students, but um, 
every every one of our children, especially those children who are not succeeding, um, should have a an individualized education plan. I mean, we should be uh, understanding where they're at, you know, whether they need a box of books or a box of food, whatever whatever it might be that, that we need to help them with. And I know that we can, uh, um, we need to do that. You know, a few years ago and my clock's not running. So, but um, Thank you for the reminder. I wanna, but um, a few years ago, those, those the developer that was talking about bringing in, uh, you know, it was Think Together. It, it was in one of our, our one of the AA after school partner, which we don't use. But we need to basically our ELOP programs. They have to be. We, we need to understand. We have to have more, more of our students that are in front of teachers or in front of educators, um, more minutes that they're that they're that they're learning, and uh, where we have to have a make have a better way of basically aligning our ELOP programs or you know what we do after school on weekends with um what we do during the day i know that we had a a program for uh some of our students uh during the weekends and it, i think it was a six week program or eight weeks program that we had before we we have to find ways to uh you know i've talked about you know getting getting students for into our tk programs or you know into our, our uh, summer programs sometimes you know parents may be reluctant sometimes they don't understand the, the need but um, we need to make sure that we, we, I won't say kidnap, but we need to make sure that we we get these students, you know, in those seats, right? And I think that it's really important for us to do that. And um, um, you know, whatever whatever resources you need, whatever it may take. Obviously, we there's a certain number of days that we need to educate, or have you know, by I could have a per per year. Uh, I would be. Uh, one of seven, but you know, if we need to add more days to the calendar, we'll, whatever we need to do, I mean, maybe it's not for that. Everybody needs to have more days uh, or more minutes, you know, for, with with our teachers, our educators. But we need to find ways uh, to make sure that we address the needs of our students. And uh, you know, obviously, what, what we've had done in the past is not working. And I'll just mention real quickly, real briefly, uh, there was a program in the past that we were using, um, and we're not using it. I think they got bought out by somebody, but basically looking at i mean he could pull up a school site and look at you know third the third grade see which classrooms are doing well find out you know what what that teacher was doing and they can collaborate together obviously that that information is not i mean we're not going to be in the weeds of things but educators have the, these informations to see what's working what's not working whether it's differentiation or not and obviously a lot of these numbers are, are uh, summative you know we got we got to look at more of the formula formative whatever testing and uh, on a weekly basis, make sure that we are moving our students forward. You know, it's we can't wait until the end of the year. And I know we're not doing that. We, we have to find better ways of doing it. Thank you, Trustee Gonzalez. Trustee Canova. And, and of course, it's getting late. But but Albert said something earlier about meeting students where they are, and and, and that's a challenge for our public school system because we're so big and we have so many students with. with from so many diverse backgrounds and so many different situations, you know, at home and et cetera. So it, without question, it makes it challenging, but we have to do that. We have to, when, when students are struggling, we, we have to find a way to make that happen. You know, uh, years ago in this district, and I think you used to use the phrase, you know, we need to have lots of tools in our toolbox and we should have an abundance of tools. You know, I, I won't burden you with car stuff, but I'll give you one little glimpse. A great mechanic has a lot of tools. I mean, they have a lot of tools. They have expensive tools, and they're able to handle all kinds of different circumstances. You know, and I think I, I want to see the classroom to be equipped with those kinds of tools and the freedom to use those kinds of tools, and also the freedom to even suggest tools that should be used. You know, I I, I don't want it to be a system that's um, because of its size and its scope is too rigid. You know, I, I think that what happened, you know, we're, we're a sizable district and, and it's 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 very easy for that to occur where we become so big. It's like trying to turn around a battleship. And, um, you know, we've used the word nimble in the past, but but we really we really need to be quick on our feet. We need to let a lot of the innovation really come from the bottom up. Honestly, uh, allow that innovation to come from the bottom up and technology today the the tools are getting so powerful now. 
parents at home who have access to the internet can do so many things to empower their students. So I think we just need to put uh, everything behind this effort in, in every way we can. Uh, I want to see robust toolboxes and I wanna see people in the classroom with maximum freedom to do whatever they feel they need to do to reach those students and make it successful. Let's not be so big that we can't get out of our own way. Thank you, Trustee Canova. Trustee Muirhead. Thank you. So um, thank you for the presentation. Um, lots of words there. But in the last few years, our elementary test scores have dropped from 62 to 58 to 57. Uh, understand there's a pandemic in there, but still those kids that we tested this year, um, you know, we're looking at third to fifth graders each year. So those fifth graders move on and new third graders come in um, and our test scores are just dropping. And our middle school test scores for ELA went from 59 to 56. Um, and you said you've, you're implementing all these new programs, but every other district that uses our elementary literacy uh, curriculum has dropped it or is in process of dropping it. And we are still studying whether we should think about changing it. And uh, it doesn't make any sense to me why we are taking so long when so many other districts have done their research and turned on a dime and are are moving in a different direction and we are still here. And um, Trustee Kenobi, you just said it really well that we we need to be nimble and light and and do the research, but do it quickly and figure it out and look at the districts around us that are changing what they're doing. Um, it all starts in elementary. So many things start in elementary. And if you if a student is behind in elementary, when are they ever going to, you know, if you're just putting them behind for the rest of their career, third grade literacy to graduation, there's direct links. If we don't get them in elementary school, and right now, half of them aren't. So we need, we, we can't wait. <laughs> we need to make a change here. And um, I just, I really wonder if, if the changes that you're proposing for this year are are enough and are significant and are really gonna change things. I would suggest to the superintendent that you keep looking at this and see if if we're on the right track. Thank you, Trustee Lieberman and then Trustee Ratterman. Thank you, President uh, Fairchild. Um, well, Trustee Muirhead kind of stole my thunder um, because um, I was gonna make the same comment about uh, the curriculum. Um, I would like, and I'm on the literacy, um, and and the charge of that committee is is not to recommend new curriculum, um, but rather to supplement what we have. That said, uh, I completely agree with Trustee Muirhead in that we need to start thinking about why we're sticking with what we're currently using when it's fairly clear it doesn't work. Um, and again, uh, as I've said before in my comments with, to Mr. Stan's presentation, and as Trustee Muirhead just said, we really have got to look at elementary school. I, I understand this need that we have to look at secondary, middle school, high school. I, 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 I understand it. But if you lose these kids in elementary school, you're done. You're not going to get them back in middle school. You're just not. And we're setting these kids up to fail because we are not addressing the issues in elementary school. We have got to give them a better foundation and we're not doing it. Um, you know, we if you've got third graders that are not meeting standards, <laughs> I mean, I just, I don't know where you go from there. I... I worry that the sense of urgency is not there. Um, and I I would like to see us act more quickly 
using what we know to be true and make change um, rather than trying to, what I say, put lipstick on a pig. And I, and I feel like we tend to do that a lot and not just in ELA, but in general. And I, I just Trusty think Mary. that Trusty we can, Lieberman. yeah, we can I'm do sorry better for interrupting, but I'm going to turn. That's okay. Quick. I just, I can't see the clock. So I don't I, know. I know that. So, so take that you. with all the kindness in my heart. Okay. I know. Trust, Bye. With Trusty Ratterman. Yeah. You know, that I, I want to commend you because that was a really impressive uh, presentation. Long, a tremendous amount of data. It's obviously a tremendous amount of work. But what's bothering me is we've seen those kind of presentations for me personally now for 19 years, okay? And we're not moving the needle. And so I kind of wonder sometimes if we're just being too clever, okay? And I and I, and I, I realize that this is probably heresy and there'll be people after me. But I know, and I'm not a teacher, so I may be way off base, but if I saw this kind of stuff coming at me every single year – with a new thing, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, with all the acronyms associated with it. By the time we figure out what the heck you're talking about, we're going to have a new set of acronyms, a new set of programs. And so the thing I hear over and over again when I'm out there is we we have so much stuff that we have to teach. We can't possibly even teach our current curriculum. We can't get it done. Um, and so to me, I'm very simplistic. Um, maybe what we need to do is give more time to the process, either increase the number of teachers, reduce the reduce the class size. I don't know the mechanism for it. I'm not going to suggest that. That's somebody like Bright, like uh, Dr. Dr. Um, Waddell to do. But it seems like we maybe need to go back and look at this from a really simplistic standpoint and say, for instance, if I had a kid that I was working with and it, and, and he couldn't get it, I'd say, okay, tell me what's wrong, and then let's. And then I work specifically on those things. So I did talk to Dr. Waddell the other day about maybe coming up with some type of tutoring program. We've got the MTSS, but again, that's so. It, it seems to be so structured and so et cetera that I don't know that it's really meeting the needs. I think sometimes you just got to sit down with a kid and say, "What do you need? What's how come you don't get this? And tell me what you know, and just understand it. And sometimes it's something remarkably simple. So I'm not a teacher, so I shouldn't tell you what to do. But it seems to me we've been a little too sophisticated um, and we need to maybe go back to some basics. I'm out of time. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to comment and then we'll go out to the public for comment. Um, I have a question um, and it's related to kind of what I asked Mr. Stam. So we're six months from our next testing assessment. We're a year from sitting in this room again, listening to a data report, what are we going to do now? Which which of all those pretty little words are do you think is going to move the needle? It would take all of it together. That's I mean, there's no. It's not a fast thing. I think focus has helped. I think us focusing on ELA and math and the the teaching and learning in the classroom is going to help. I And it's going to take every single one of us. Okay. Um, we have, we've heard this in other presentations, and it's something that I know that my fellow board members struggle with, and that's with regards to professional development. And we talk about offering. And my question is, why don't we require if we need foundational reading skills, why don't we, when we have our professional development days, require that teachers attend training on foundational reading? Our professional development days are in the teacher in the teacher work year, so they are required to be there unless they're ill or out for an, a, a specific reason on our five PD days a year. They are required to be there. Okay, so maybe my instance, question is like clear. last. So last year, every one of those five days was spent on ELA. I mean ELD, both designated and integrated. 
Okay, so if our one of our focuses it's in your presentation is on foundational reading, why don't we require on those professional development days, those elementary teachers to attend the training in foundational reading? That might be a plan for next year. Why Our can't PD it be a plan for this year? Our PD days are planned out. And um, with regard to our professional learning, the teachers, the, the pool of surveys that we took, teachers would like, they wanted some planning time. They wanted some choice. They wanted to focus as um, Trustee Canova said, to, tr to innovate, to think on their own in their, with their peers in their classroom to try to make a difference. And I know we've gone back and forth with that. We continue to work with our um, leadership, our union leadership to determine what the best avenue is for professional development in a perfect world. You would go back to the structures and systems that we have and our PD could have occurred within the workday. And then we would not have to offer any optional. Okay. Um, so one of the things that was also mentioned is that we're having evidence folders from TK to kindergarten. Are we going to continue evidence folders in the elementary level? Because I realize those have been discontinued. I can't answer that right now, and I can look into it. Okay. Um, I have no more questions right now. We're going to go out to the public for public comment. If there's anyone who would like to make public comment, you may line up. I have no slips. But before we go out to public comment, I can see how many people are going to comment, and we're going to need to have a motion to extend the meeting. Um, we currently have this item to finish as well as one more. So uh, does anyone want to make a motion to extend the meeting for one hour? So moved. So moved, we have a second. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Trustee Canova, Trustee Gonzalez, Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Muirhead. Yes. Trustee Ratterman. Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent and I vote yes. You can vote if you would like, Trustee Valdez. Yes. Thank you. We That passes six to zero with Trustee Ryan being absent and Trustee Valdez also voting yes. Okay, thank you, Ms. Waisaki. Jody. Okay, thank you. You didn't have to start that, it's okay. Um, so I wanted to give a little context in that teachers who go to teacher training, not we're not talking about getting a master's or a reading certificate or anything of that nature. General teachers who go to teachers prep classes to learn how to become a teacher are not trained in this level that's necessary to teach our children to break the code. It is not part of the teaching program. That means we have teachers who have the best intentions, but they don't have their own, unless they went out and sought it themselves, they don't have the level of training that you're asking them to put in place. So that leads me to point two. So my second point is, and all the research that I've been reading, and I'm not going to go into everything we've done in the, in the um, elementary literacy, is that you can't train teachers to this level on a two-day PD. It's not going to stick. And it's too complicated. Teaching reading is incredibly complicated. It is not a easy. It is not going to be a one and done. It's not going to be a silver bullet. Those things don't exist. My third thing that I think we need to wrap our head around is we need to support our parents before their kids ever step foot on site, how to build those early literacy skills, how to develop the oral language, how to start getting their brain ready for reading before they ever come to us. We can support our parents in that. My next point, I have a lot of points. My next point is, um, okay. Um, is that um, we need to support our middle school teachers because they are also not trained 
to help children read who are reading four and five grade levels below grade level. Thank you, Ms. Waisaki. I would encourage you to email the rest of your list too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. My name is Dorothy Gio, and I'm following what Ms. Misaki said. The teachers are not trained because from about 1990, schools were following Lucy Calkins' units of study if they were teaching reading at all. And that approach is not consistent with what neuroscientists have learned about how the brain learns. And so the teachers we have don't know the science. They haven't got the tools. Point two was that reading is complex. Yes, it's the skills of first knowing that there's a language that can be broken up into syllables and to hear the different sounds and then to know that it connects to what's on a page. And that needs to be taught to teachers how to teach it and how to teach vocabulary before the kids tackle a little reading passage and how to know something about that by reading to them from the teachers. And of course, the parents need to be basically involved. And so it's new curriculum and new teacher training. Patches don't work. Even heroic patches, as we've heard, all those patches that you heard about could be slapped onto the new way, a new garment, new technology. It's got to come. Next. Hi, I'm Rochelle Burnside. I'm the secondary English history and avid TOSA for the district. Um, I wanted to uh, bridge off of what um, Ms. Waisaki was saying. Um, in terms of this kind of structural change, um, I will just say that this is my fourth year in the district. And in the four years that I've been in the district, we've had four different focuses in those four years. And so teachers kind of have initiative fatigue. Um, and so it's very difficult to make that kind of cultural and structural change when they don't know that there's going to be initiative that lasts more than a single year. And in terms of the kind of um, professional development, professional learning that we need to do to make these changes, this is a multi-year instructional shift. It is a cultural shift. The kinds of um, structural instructional shifts we need to make we're talking about scaffolds. Scaffolds are not things that you add. Scaffolds are the way that you structure your lesson. That is the scaffold for this kind of literacy across the curriculum. And that requires teachers to relearn how they do their entire teaching. That's huge. That's terrifying and that's scary. And we need to support them in doing that. That is so hard for teachers and we've not been supporting them in doing that. And that's why we're not seeing what the changes that we need to see. Um, that also requires, as Marjorie said, it's not one and done. That requires a lot of follow-up coaching and support. And we do not have a culture of coaching in this district. We have instructional coaches in the sites. This is the second year we've been doing that. But again, that's new. And that requires professional trust. Um, that requires um, building relationships, et cetera, and that takes time. So I understand your frustration and I understand why you want to see change, but that is not going to be something that's going to happen in a year. This is a long-term shift. Wow. My name is Kinkin Brock and I'm following on other things that, following on what people have said Teachers are professionals. I'm grateful for those who have done things on their time and their dime to learn about the science of reading, to improve their knowledge. There's got to be a huge step. Um, there's got to be a, a huge amount of new knowledge brought into the school district. There are knowledge and practice standards for teachers of reading that um, should be looked at. 
it does need you. We the curriculum does need to change, sure, but knowledge and and the knowledge that teachers have comes first, and the idea of having teachers trained and then having someone a trainer embedded in the school you know checking in with them during the year that's the way change is successful and it's not um to add on to that one and done teaching is reading is let me back up I'm glad to hear everybody say that the elementary grades are the are the most important. And then back up and say teaching reading is not picking from a menu. It's not following a diet. It's a lifestyle change. And the change that needs to be made in this district needs to keep on being made. There can't be a next, next big thing, as been said before. It's just got to be doing things in accordance with what's known about what works and sticking with it and perfecting it. Thank you, are there any more comments in the room? Okay, I'm closing comments in the room. Are there any comments on the Zoom? Okay, I'm closing comments on the Zoom. Do we have any board members who would like to speak again? Trustee Gonzalez. So as far as, and I think I mentioned it to, to Mr. Stam, is there anything that, um, as far as resources that you, you you can ask the board? I mean, can we send everybody away for 10, 10 days in the summer to do PD? I mean, I, I, I don't, is there is there something that, that you see that would, would uh, help us short term, even though this is a long term problem, right? But um, something that we can do uh, to, to, to move this along. That's what we will be developing over the next couple of weeks as we iron out the math and ELA plans moving forward. If I could, could, could end? Yes, um, thank you. You know, I I hear all of the things that, that have been said tonight and and they really resonate. I mean, I, reading is, is complex. It, you know, it involves curriculum, but it's not just curriculum. It involves instruction. It's not just instruction. It involves support. It's not only support. I had the opportunity to principal two elementary schools where we closed the gap from um, 42 points uh, to, to less than eight points at one of the schools in two years. But it was, and we focused on literacy and it was talking about it every day. It was providing uh, support for teachers. It was providing coaching it was having peer learning circles it was it, looking at it every every day and having those conversations and getting better and it wasn't a simple thing or an easy thing but it was something we certainly found joy in and i think that the focus that we're bringing now the reason that we convene this group is to get the best thinking of teachers and our experts um, and and looking at research, being mindful of that too, to identify those things. And I know that we need to take bold action. Uh, we just want to be smart about it and take the right steps as well. Trustee Raderman. Yeah, um, you know, one of the pieces that resonated with me, and I sort of alluded it to when I talked earlier, was the initiative fatigue. So we've had four initiatives, I think was what was said in a very short period of time. And ostensibly, all of those were pretty good. And the phrase, don't let the perfect be the enemy of good. I think maybe what we need to do is say, look, let's do on our long-term plan. Let's come up with this perfect plan that's going to do everything right. But maybe get together with our teachers, our teachers' union, et cetera, and say, okay, of the stuff we've been doing, what was working the best? What we can get behind? And I like Trustee um, mm -hmm. Gonzalez's idea. If you need, like, we want to have a special course during the summer that where we do intensive training and you know, we come up with some con compensation scheme that makes that work right for everybody. So it's a win-win, uh, whatever it takes. But I think the one thing I hope you're hearing from this board is a sense of urgency. We don't want another student to wait and be left behind because we're trying to find the perfect solution. I think we need to get the job done now. And good was much better than perfect if, the, if perfect never happens. Okay, so... I'm, I'm done. Thanks. 
Thank you, Trustee Ratterman. It's kind of interesting because you've echoed both of you something I said at the beginning of the literacy meeting last week, and that this is what this board wants to spend money on. I mean, we just heard someone say a week, two weeks, what do we need to do to get our teachers trained appropriately to teach reading? Um, some of us uh, who have worked with kids who maybe shouldn't been have been identified as eligible for special ed, but that was their only way to get appropriate reading instruction was for their needs. Find the pace very frustrating. As a parent of a child who needed, who would have benefited from a science of reading instruction approach, but couldn't get it in her school, Luckily, I had the background that I could support my child. And I felt almost guilty about being able to do that because I knew that there were other parents that didn't know that their child just needed a little bit of this. And I often wondered if my child would have ended up on an IEP if she had a parent with a different educational background. We have over-identified special ed. Why is that? And one of the questions that I asked over and over again when I was an employee and when I first got on the board is why do our kids score low enough to qualify? And we saw the scores. And that's why we have an over-identification problem is because they are scoring low enough to qualify. And we need to all look in the mirror and ask us what we're going to do different. Trustee Canova. That is an interesting point you made. And, and when that occurs, then an IEP is triggered. And as Albert alluded to earlier, the concept of an IEP uh, implemented in the right way, we're talking about individualized instruction, the success of the student. Uh, you know, I, I think we need to kind of rethink this whole thing that, that, you know, we need to find ways to cater to and customize what we're doing to individual students for the success. I remember when my kids were going through the school, this district had embraced whole language. And, uh, and when my wife and I were first exposed to it, we were puzzled. Um, that they, that we asked, well, how will, I'll use my daughter as an example, how will Jackie know that that's not correct? Oh, 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 Trustee Canovo, she'll self-edit. So I went home and I told my wife, well, evidently at some point, Jackie's gonna self-edit. And we were puzzled with that because, you know, when we went and she was educated, my wife was educated here in the West Coast, I was educated in the DC area and um, in public school. And I also attended some private schools later, um, long story. But, um, but at any rate, rate, there was no self-editing. You know, the teachers will quite readily say, that's not right, that's not correct. And you would learn. And during the 90s, there was this huge thing about self-esteem, self-esteem, don't damage the student's self-esteem under any set of circumstances. This is when sport, sporting events would take place. Everybody wins. We've all won. There's no loser here. And we put such a focus on self-esteem and the self-editing and, and the whole whole language thing. I think we went off the tracks there. I, I think some really critically important things were lost along the way. We say we want resilient students. You know, that's part of our, our, our code, right? Um, think about how that relates to the notion of what was going on in the 90s, the self-esteem thing, the whole language, the self-edit. So interesting times. And I think we're seeing the uh, results of that long, long-term thing that, that was so embraced. Thank you, Trustee Canova. Uh, if there are no further comments, we'll go on to our next discussion item in dot one, use of facility, current and proposed fees. So like our previous presentations, we will start with the presentation then we will go to comments from the board and then we will go out 
to members of the public. Before we begin, I would like to thank uh, Miss Healy, one, for multiple presentations in one night. But also, I want to thank Miss Healy and Mr. Shield for hearing the board when we talked about not wanting to be uh, surprised. Um, the big reveal, I believe, Trustee Ratterman called it. We, you have done your due diligence to take this board on this journey with you. Um, they, we've had a series of very comprehensive reports, and I really thank you for your time and um, your outreach, your communication, not only to the board, but to the public and to our facility users. And so I just kind of wanted to start with that because um, it's taken a lot of effort not to do the big reveal. And I want you to know, know that I noticed that you're not doing the big reveal. So thank you. I believe Mr. Shill wanted to say a few words before you start your presentation. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have much more to say other, beyond that, other than um, when we get to public comments, um, uh, there was a person here earlier this evening who wanted to speak, and unfortunately she had to leave. So she gave me a written comment. So um, I can either pass it along to the board now, or I can wait until public comment time. Why don't you just read it during public comment time? All right, that's fair. Okay. All right, sounds good. Michelle? Now it is. Okay. Well, while they're loading that up, um, tonight is the big reveal. And um, you've all seen it since you've, spoiler alert, uh, agenda came out on Friday. But um, so tonight we're going to be talking about the use of facilities, current and proposed fees. I'm going to go over a review of the user groups that we reviewed last time and then the user group's proposed fee percentages and facility use proposed fees for each of the entities and buildings and locations on our campuses that we reviewed over the last two presentations. And then finally, the fee implementation schedule. Once again, we need to increase our fees because our operating costs have increased. Um, salaries have increased. Everything is increased, materials, supplies, building materials, um, everything to run our district has increased over the past, well, especially the past couple of years, but since 1994. Um, and so that's really why we need to increase these fees. Okay. Oh. All right, here is our proposed fees and to our user groups. Group one, once again, is not changing, and those are our district groups, our PTA and PTOs. Group 1.5 are youth organizations that are approved by the board, and they currently pay nothing for any of their use of facility rentals, and we're proposing that they pay 10% of the direct costs that we calculated in our presentation last or two weeks ago. Group two currently pays between 25 and 30%, and we're recommending they pay 25% of the direct costs and actual costs. Group three remains at 50%, and group four actually decreases from 100% to 80%, but that's because of the increase in the fees that we're seeing. The next couple of slides are going to follow the same format, and the purple is also color-coded back to the presentation from two weeks ago. And so the purple is going to be our buildings and our standard buildings. On the left is our current standard classroom, what we currently charge per hour for our standard classroom. And then next to that is the proposed fee. And the next few slides will follow all of this. So the current fee is on the left and then the proposed fee is on the right for each of the user groups. The slide after that refers to the same slide that we had last, last time. So the last time we had what our current fees were, and this slide shows our proposed fees in comparison to the same fees that we showed last time of all of our existing resident, or all of our users who are neighbors to us. 
So Cupertino, San Jose, Campbell, as well as the city of Santa Clara. So this slide and the following slides will show our proposed fees in relation to our neighboring entities. This slide goes on to the auxiliary gyms and main gyms and the fee comparisons to those. And as you can see, some of them are increasing a little bit, some of them more, but it's all based on those percentages from slide four that, um, that show that percentage of the direct cost fee that we're charging. This slide shows once again, the auxiliary gyms and main gyms and in those fee proposed fees in comparison to our neighboring entities. This slide shows the artificial surfaces. So the darker green is all of our artificial turf and the artificial track is in pink. We are we did separate out the artificial track because that was something that was requested by the board. However, we don't really want to charge just for the artificial track. We find it very difficult to separate the track from the field that's in the football field that's inside of the track and keeping people off the bleachers. So our recommendation is to not have a separate fee for the artificial track, but to roll that fee into the cost of the stadium. And once again, this is the combination. Um, these, the next two slides are separated out. This is just the turf and the artificial practice field turfs and then the stadium turf and those costs that are compared to our local neighbors. This is the natural grass and we've decided to combine these. So currently we have a separate fee for our baseball softball fields and our practice fields. And in the future, we'd like to move forward with just one set fee for our practice baseball, any natural grass fields, we'd like to just have one fee because many of those fields are used differently. There may be a softball field at Cabrillo, but soccer uses the majority of it. And so those two fields kind of overlap. And so it was odd to have a separate fee for the softball baseball fields when some of those on the elementary schools and our middle school sites overlap. So we're recommending just one flat fee for any parcel, any piece of grass that's natural. Change from daily to hourly too. Yes. That is a larger, um, so the baseball softball fields were charged from daily rates and we are looking to move that to hourly rate. And that is to be more competitive with um, our neighboring entities that also charge hourly rates. And ours are still lower. Yeah. Can I just ask for a clarification on this? Yes. These charge? I just, on, on the Santa Clara Unified line, there's, there's, Number slash number and then number slash number. Is that the one B? 1.5 and two and then three right. and four. Okay. But thank yes. you because I forgot to mention that on the first slide. So yeah, it's a little bit difficult for us to compare because a lot of our other entities have the profit and nonprofit rate. Um, but that again was determined by our use of facilities task force back in 2018 that they wanted to veer away from that because a lot of for-profit companies do have very low rates for our students and do a lot of good for our community. And so they didn't want fees that were based on profit and nonprofit. Um, they wanted them based on how many students of ours that each of those entities um, provide services to. This slide is the hard courts and parking lot and then tennis courts. Um, we are also looking to combine these two rates, the parking lots we used to charge a daily rate and we're looking to charge those as hourly rates. And as you can see, those have decreased. Um, we've, we rarely get parking lot requests. Usually it's um, an entity that wants to do an event in a parking lot and maybe it's a drive through um, give a gift giveaway or something like that. And then they want to rent the parking lot. But for the most part, um, we don't see that. And then the tennis courts, we we are moving to something a little different for tennis courts. Um, we used to have per hour per court rates, and that got pretty confusing when we may have seven courts at one site, eight courts in another site, and we aren't set up to rent out two courts or three courts out of eight courts. So we decided that it would be 
more equitable to rent out all of the courts. So if you're renting courts at Peterson, you're renting all the courts at Peterson, and it would be $18 an hour instead of a rate per court. And we looked at the the next slide shows why the group 1.5 and 2 and then 3 and 4 pay the same rate. And that's because we were looking at what the nonprofit and for-profit on the tennis courts and the other entities are paying. And so this is the only one where we're, we're going off of our 10%, 25%, 50%, and 80%. And we really wanted it to be a little bit more fair for the users and a little bit more equitable than using those percentage rates. The city of Santa Clara and Los Gatos, Saratoga, they are the only two in our area that do charge per court per rate. So um, those rates would be much higher than the other school districts that surround us. The pools have um, also changed their rates. And so this is, we were charging a per day rate for the pools and now we're looking at an hourly rate and so those fees um, have changed. Most most of our pool rentals are for, for between two and four hours. And so we feel that this is um, rates that our people who rent our pools can afford. And it does also follow the 10%, um, 25%, 50%, and 80%. And as you can see here, the other pool rentals uh, for the school districts that have pools around us. The theater, we are changing how we charge for our theater um, a little bit. So previously we had the theater rentals up to four hours was a minimum. And then it would, it we charged for every two hours after that. And it got really confusing because some people would rent, they would pay for eight hours, they would rent it for seven hours, and then they would stay an extra hour because they paid for eight hours, but our staff was only anticipating being there for seven hours. And maybe we only had custodial coverage for seven hours. And so it got a little muddy when we went back and said, well, we were only anticipating you to be there seven hours, even though technically you paid for eight. And so um, we, when we went back and we talked a lot to um, our two theater techs that manage our theaters and they agreed that having a minimum of four hours for the theaters was standard. And then every hour after that would be a set price. So the column in the middle is gonna be the hourly price that each of those groups would pay for every hour after four hours. And that those rates include the theater technician that has to be on site during that. So um, those fees are a little higher, but that's because it includes a person who's there. And then during performances, it's they have to have a custodian on site and then for practices they would have maybe a custodian there in the beginning or at the end for two hours but it, they wouldn't have to be there for the whole time these are the hourly rates that we are adding um, when other entities need custodial grounds the the only place that we require grounds at the moment is the wilcox uh, baseball fields and that's because of they are still regular grass natural grass and so our grounds department does go out and uh, maintain those fields during the day if there's a tournament going on and if someone runs them so we do have um, our grounds department there as well as a custodian when the Wilcox fields are um, are rented And our implementation schedule. So we have been doing some outreach to the majority of our, almost all of our 1.5 group users um, over the past year and a half, letting them know that some increase of fees was happening. And then I also sent an email to all of our users, anyone who's registered with an email with Facilitron um, for the past 18 months within our district, received an email on November 3rd, letting them know about this presentation and the increase of fees. We are hoping to bring back the use of fees for approval in December. And then we would have Facilitron send out an email notifying everyone of the approved fees and the change of fees. And we are anticipating them starting for any new reservation 
that occurs after June 1st of 2024. So right now, everyone has their reservations in through May 31st. And so any new reservations, and the reservation window usually opens in March. And so when that reservation period opens in March, the new fees would take effect starting for any reservation in June 1st. In talking to our group 1.5, our biggest users, we wanted to be conscious of this impact to them and their budgets. And so we are proposing a 50% fee increase for them. So between June 1st, 2024 and May 31st, 2025, they would pay 50% of the 1.5 group rate. So they would basically be paying 5% of the direct cost of the rentals. And then starting June 1st, 2025, they would be paying the 100% fee. 100% of the 10%, yes. So they would be paying the full 10%. Any questions? Well, Ms. Healy, I want to first thank you for just an amazingly thorough report. Um, I I appreciate the um, thought and care that was taken in considering all of our groups and the, our students and our keeping up our facilities. I will go to the board, um, Trustee Canova, and then Trustee Raderman. And then Trustee Muirhead. First of all, I apologize for having you. You've had a long day. I mean, we're approaching 11 o'clock. This is a really long day for you. But uh, again, your detailed reports are so stunning. Um, I really like the uh, information about the other districts and what they're charging. Awesome to see that at a glance. That gives me everything I need to know at a glance. I mean, just really detailed, really thorough. Um, your presentations are great. Thank you. Trustee Ratterman. Yeah, thank you. So um, last meeting, I asked for a detailed cost, and um, uh, Michelle, uh, Miss, Miss Healy was nice enough to meet with me on this Friday and go through her spreadsheet. Um, and then she was able to get me a copy of it Tuesday. And by the way, this spreadsheet is truly impressive, the amount of work that she's put into this. And I do believe, I honestly believe she's trying to be very, very fair and even-handed and honest and straightforward with everything in it. So I just want to see if any of my comments later make you think differently. I think she's done a marvelous job. But just like Trustee Canova said earlier, uh, he reminded us of our R chart. And on the top of our R chart um, is our community. And our facilities are owned by our community. They're not ours. They're owned by the community. They paid taxes. They they Everything was bought by the community mm -hmm. through taxes. Um, and we build these, these facilities with the primary purpose of educating our, our students. Keep in mind, our students are everything from, we joke about womb to tomb, everything from, um, you know, a, 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 an infant all the way through to an older, you know, 90-year-old man uh, through adult ed and this type of thing. Um, we also regularly rec encourage and sometimes even subsumet, subsidize extracurricular activities through our schools and education. We have groups out there in the community that are volunteering. There are people, there are people that paid for these fields and they're volunteering their time without pay to help our kids with extracurricular activities. I wanna remove every possible barrier from them being able to do that job, okay? I want them to have the lowest possible cost. And I realize that there are some, there's some things that we're going to have to, to recover, but uh, when we created 1.5, the idea was to eliminate those costs, let these people perform well. And I think the biggest problem that we have is actually in the priority codes. Um, I think there's some areas in there that need to be reformed, particularly putting adults in the highest possible cost category. And I've run out of time, so I'll have to take another bite of the apple later. Okay. Uh, any other trustees? Trustee Muirhead? Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Um, first, Thank you for putting all this together and um, talking to some, to our users and letting them know. Um, uh, first question was, it says that our 1.5 users get approved by the board. Um, do those come to us annually? Are they on consent or something? I don't remember seeing They're that. They're supposed to. Okay. So we're hoping to start implementing that. Um, and that would, we did it um, pre-COVID and then that stopped. And so um, we would like to start implementing that again. Okay, 
good. I, I thought I'd, I didn't remember seeing it. So, okay, that's good that we're bringing it back. And then I'm just wondering why so many of our rates are so much lower than the other districts in the city and such. It's like we're, we're required by law, aren't we, to only ask for them to cover um, our costs. We're not supposed to be making a profit on this sort of thing. So uh, I would imagine other districts have the same rule. Why are ours so low compared to others? We didn't want to have sticker shock to all of our users. So we really looked at the cost that it's taking us to have our direct, our direct costs. And then what we felt would be an appropriate increase of fees because we haven't increased our fees in so long. And so many of the other entities have been slowly increasing them um, year after year. Some school districts put a, an, an inflation clause in their fees and they say every year our fees are automatically okay. increasing 3% or 5% to keep up with inflation. And so we haven't done that. And so we thought about proposing higher fees, but we really wanted to be fair to the community at this point because it is the first time we're increasing fees in a very long time. And we wanted them just to feel more comfortable with the fact that we're not trying to gouge them. We're not trying to be um, just money hungry, but these are reasonable fees for now. And some of the fees did increase quite a bit. And so for those users, our existing users, we didn't want to propose unfair pricing. So are, are the fees that you're proposing here covering our costs? No. So if you go back to um, slide number four, they're not. Um, so group 1.5 is only covering 10% of the actual cost it costs us to maintain those facilities. Group two is paying 25% of the cost to maintain the facilities. Group three is paying 50% and group four is paying 80%. And in other districts, they might be um, paying instead of 50%, they might be paying 100% or 25% mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. So we, you're, you've just chosen percentages here for our groups. So do you, do, you, do you think we should be over time raising the percentages or putting in um, some COLA percent or should we, so that organizations sort of know what we're gonna do? Like, you know, so if we're gonna do a, you know, a 3% or 5% COLA, whatever it is, that they know to build that into their rates every year. Yeah, my hope would be to bring that back to the board for discussion. Um, we wanted to get these rates approved and moving forward. And then in a year or so, we would come back and potentially have that discussion, um, see where we are, do another cost analysis every year. The costs are going to change. And so we would do another cost analysis and then have that discussion with the board. Okay, I would just... I would suggest that we do that sooner rather than later so that these organizations can do their own planning, just like you've given them a hundred and mm -hmm. a, a year and a half uh, of warning that they're going to have to set their fees in the spring for the following year. They're going to know. I'll, I'll take a turn now. Um, I just want to thank you for your planning. First off, I'm a planner. I love that we are seeing this in November for something that's going to happen in June and then in the following June. So I think you've given ample time for those to plan. Some of the rates are raising, some of them are going down. Um, overall, we're below everyone else, except for a few minor little areas. Um, one of the things I keep thinking about is something that um, I learned from my parents. And that is that when you have to pay just a little to use something, you tend to treat it better. Um, yes, the community um, taxes fund these fields. Um, but if we're going to give someone exclusive access to a field or a room or something, asking for a little bit, and it, it really is a little bit um, of to to use that facility and have exclusive use of that facility, I believe is appropriate. Um, these are schools dedicated to children. So I think it's appropriate to have lower rates for those groups that are servicing or providing services for children that are for, that are 80% or more from Santa Clara, because these were paid by the for by the citizens of Santa Clara for the children of Santa Clara for the schools. Um, 
The other thing I keep thinking about is that we haven't raised our rates since 1994. And um, maybe it's because 2024 is coming up. But for the first part of 1994, I was still a teenager. And um, that was a long time ago. And I, I think it's an appropriate time to look at adjusting our rates. Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank you for the report. Um, I, I concur a lot with what uh, our president just mentioned. Uh, but um, I, I guess uh, one of the things that, that I, I know I've mentioned in the past, uh, especially with our liaison meeting with the city of Santa Clara, was uh, how do we uh, how do we help uh, collaborate better with the city? You know, I, I talked about maybe having having their folks have keys to, to our field, which maybe is not the best idea, but you know, how do we collaborate better with them? And I think at the, at the end of the day is uh, just to, in the, thinking about um, that, you know, we are entrusted with, with these resources to provide for our students and, and if possible, the community as well. At the same time, we understand that there there has to be some uh, mechanism to to make sure that we maintain and eventually upgrade the the fields. Um, we know that uh, like our neighbor industry, Fremont Union, um, in installed their uh, their turf fields before we did, and and they're already looking at replacing them. We know there's a lifespan of of turf, so there's you know obviously it has to be some mechanism that we uh, that we have to make sure that we can get that done in the future. Um, and even though I would agree that that the community has really uh, helped and uh, provided for us to be able to provide um, the facilities for our students, at the same time, uh, I wouldn't want to ha prematurely have to go back to them and say, hey, you know, what, we have to upgrade these fields because, you know, they've just been overutilized or what have you. So there has to be some mechanism. And, you know, I, I know that uh, even though our operational funds through uh, – Property taxes are not the same as, as the way that our bonds are funded, but we know that operationally we're about seventy percent that comes from commercial. So it's not it's not like people; it's it's corporations that that, that really pay for the majority of our uh, of our funding. Operationally, partial taxes are I mean not partial but bonds are a little bit different. Thank you so much. Um, we will now go out to members of the public who would like to speak. We'll go first to Mr. Shield. Did you have a comment or were you going to read your public no, I comment? I have a comment. Okay. Um, in regards to collaborating with the city, um, we are doing that. We have been working on uh, joint use agreements with the city and collaborating with them. Uh, the city is still using a couple. They still have rights to use a couple parcels owned by the district. And um, the city has updated their rates at least once, if not twice. Once so and far. they're going to be doing it again. And they're going to be updating December. again. And um, I will say that one we, Miss Healy and I know that um, one of the partners associated with one of our athletic programs actually tried to rent one of those facilities that is really a district facility, but the city has the ability to use it, and they're going to be charged significantly in order to be use that property, and they have no use. There is no waiver for a community organization like ours anymore, um, and so. Um, we're trying to help support them through that process, but um, the city is charging fees for use of facilities as well, uh, differently than they've been doing it in the past. So I just want to uh, provide that information to you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Shield. Okay, we'll have you read your public comment, and then we will go out um, to public comment um, from where well, I have slips from jo Joanna Lujan, Lujan or Lujan, Lujan. Kirk Anderson and Yalving, I did I say that wrong? It's probably wrong. For it. Okay. Uh, that's who actually I'm reading. That's who you're reading. Yes. Uh, uh, do you want me to read that from the dais? No, you can read it. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna time you just because this person only gets two minutes. That's fine. Um, so um this is from Ms. Forat. Uh, who wrote her comment on behalf of the Phoenix Physical Arts LLC, which is a volleyball school. She says, I'm concerned about um, item N1 to increase the rental rate. My program is to give students from elementary to high school volleyball lessons during weekends. Uh, she's been, she says she's been using Santa Clara Adult Ed, uh, Wilson High School gym for over 15 years. 
Um, she knows that the rental rates are still the same as they always have been. However, in recent years, there's also been custodial staff fees and uh, there was the maintenance fee and, um, and we're proposing to get rid of that for the last five years. Uh, those additional fees are actually adding up to more than the rental fee that she has. Um, and so the total rental fee is more than double than what it was before because of those hourly fees. Um, she also says that there are two volleyball courts in the gym. The maximum students that she can take is 24, and she needs 12 students uh, just to cover her expenses. Um, and she says she doesn't even have 12 students to attend the class during the summers, but she continues to rent the gym during the summer months because she's afraid of get, losing her access uh, and her priority access to the gym. So uh, she said that's all she wanted to say and that she's just really concerned about the increase to the rental rates. Thank you. All right, uh, Joanna, and then Kirk. Hi, um, I just, do I disagree that, that people should have to pay? No, I don't. However, I don't feel that every entity should have to pay um, the proposed fee. Um, I've got a few figures for you, 56, six and eight, almost 56 years that Craig Connolly has been coaching. 6 a.m., um, actually 5.45, he's at the field on, on home games, as is some of his coaching staff and parents. 8 p.m., 8.30, 9 o'clock are Craig and Linda as well, um, coaching staff, um, parents, uh, football players, cleaning up. We're doing the cleanup. Um, Craig and his, his staff are maintaining. No one's here from Briarwood. We, when we did Briarwood, um, the the league did their own mowing, did their own maintaining. Um, I'm just saying to take it, take that into consideration. Um, I know that there's fees involved, but keep in mind um, when fees were hiked for Grant High School in Sacramento area, which is an economically disadvantaged area, um, the, the, the programs folded. The long term of that is what happens to our kids when they go to um, high school. If the proposed fees are higher, that's going to be passed down to the families, single family parents that are barely making it as it is, but they're keeping their kids out of trouble because that's their only focus. They're not going to be able to afford to do it. And so what are these kids going to do? And some of the sped kids, one of mine included, that could be their, their morale booster that, um, they could get a scholarship that could keep them going. That could be make them or break them on whether or not they graduate. So we've talked all night long about how our kids can succeed, but sports is a, a way for them to succeed. And they start at youth, Larnie, Carney Lansford, um, as well as our own John Hendy. So I'm just saying, they started at Lions. And Thank Empire. you. Thank you. Kirk. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kirk Anderson. I represent the Industrial Volleyball League. We've been renting the from the school district since 1980. We've paid over $1.4 million in rental fees over those years. We received the email, as Healy mentioned, uh, Friday night at 9 p.m. And it said that, uh, quote, the district has not updated the hourly rental rates since 1994. And that's the main reason I'm here and sat here for five hours waiting to address that issue. In 1994, the IVL, that's us, was charged $90 for three hours in the main gym at Wilcox. Currently, the IVL has charged $360 for three hours in the main gym at Wilcox. So somewhere along the line, there was some kind of a fee increase. Some people would say that was basically quadrupled. There's also a fee increase this past year, $60 per night, termed a maintenance custodial fee. It still amounted to a fee increase. Nine-week season is how we do it. That's $540 more for us in fees. For six teams on the three courts at Wilcox, that's almost $100 more per team. Many of our people are family people. This is their one night out. They can't afford, some of them can't afford the new fees. We've lost several community teams this past season, and it's going to continue. I'm concerned about the women's teams that play on Thursdays at Peterson and Wilcox. No one else, just us. No one else offers women's leagues. Dozens of teams, hundreds of players will not have an alternative place to play. Increasing the gym rent $186 more per night is an increase I have not seen before. That's over 
$546 per night would be the new cost at Wilcox for three hours of gym time. Foothill College Main Gym and Menlo College Pavilion, probably the two best facilities in the area, do not come close to that price range. Would like to see, I'd like to not see members of the Santa Clara and Sunnyvale community be excluded from using the gyms, but it appears that's where we're heading. One of your employees said at a meeting earlier thank this you. year. Thank you. Your time. Thank you. Your time is up. You can email the board. We you can, can email the board. Fees. Well, we can't afford to do that. Do we have any comments, any raised hand comments in the Zoom? Thank you. Do we have any further comments for Ms. Healy? It is, I just want to point out, it is now 11.12. Our meeting will be uh, adjourning at 11.30. This will come back to us uh, for action next, next month. Yes, yeah, yes, it will come back for action next meeting. Trustee Raderman. Yeah, so to me, the, one of the uh, there's a couple things I want love to ask, and one of them I don't want to ask only because I don't want to put Michelle through the grief, and that is if we decided not to rent any of our facilities to anyone, how much would our costs change? I don't think our costs would change that much. The other thing is in our cost accounting. We have an option as to whether or not to include in the cost accounting the recovery of capital investment, i.e. it costs us $100 million to build the gym, so we can charge $100 million divided by whatever the square footage and the time useful life of the gym is. That's an option that was changed about eight years ago or something like that, where uh, it used to be that the Civic Center Act did not allow you to do that. Now they do. And I'm not sure what, why that happened, but it did change. And so when I've looked through the cost accounting, and I'm sorry, I really wanted to have some real solid examples. I just ran out of bandwidth and time. From Tuesday to now, there was too many things already on my calendar to go through. You've got to see this report. You're really impressive with your report. I mean, this thing is like eight pages of stuff like that. Um, I printed a lot of it out. But that, that cost accounting uh, is a very tricky, dangerous thing. Uh, one of the things we brought up last time and still has not been addressed, we use the industry standard 2,000 hours, but our schools operate on almost 15-hour days. That's 5,500 hours in, in the course of a week. So if you divide by a larger number, you get a smaller cost per hour. And so we're not doing that. So I'm not comfortable with this. I really want us to take a look at the, at the groups that we've got. I really want to see us include adults, what I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> I also want to be be sure that, you know, that we're, and, and the one gentleman is right. The, one of the things that's cranked up, I'm going to run out of time too, is the fees. Yes, we didn't increase the rental rate, but we've added a whole bunch of additional fees on top. So thanks. So just so you know, Thank you. I'm not happy moving forward with this. I want to see us do more work. Um, that's fine, but you're one of seven. I'm one of seven. Thank you. Trustee Canova. I'm another one of seven. And what I would like to see um, when this comes back to us, and because he's in the room, I don't want to, I'm not going to put you on the spot tonight, Larry, but maybe when this comes back to us, there's no one in this room that knows better because Andy just made a statement that he really doesn't know if he can, if it's factual or not, that the use of these fields in this manner has, in his opinion, zero effect on the lifespan of those fields so i, I well you alluded to that and so i would like to hear from you when this comes back to us you know not to bring you into the fray but just uh, some real hard data in terms of the lifespan of our fields and um and to give us something to kind of work with in terms of what does this type of use do or not do to the fields it, the district has to go through a great deal of trouble to get the, as you know, through all these bond measures to, to get those passed, to get the funding from the community to do this kind of infrastructure work. And we do have a fiduciary responsibility to those taxpayers who supported those bonds to build this infrastructure that we are managing it well so it will last as long as possible. 
so that the district doesn't have to go back to the community in too soon a period of time for another bond to redo those fields. And you've seen fields that have had to be redone in your career. So not tonight, but when this comes back to the board, anything that you're comfortable with, that gives us at least an anchor point in terms of the lifespan of the fields and the impact of the use of the fields in relationship to what is trying to occur mm -hmm. here. The other thing too, is just you know to, to somewhat counter, not really counter Andy, but, but we had a very clear presentation of what the other districts charge. And, and we are clearly the least expensive of the districts around us. So that hits home with me. That, that's an important piece of information, but not tonight, but something like that would be helpful. I want to just kind of take a, a pulse of the board of who would like to see the presentation come back as an action item next board meeting. Okay, so we have a majority of the board that would like to see this come back. Bonnie, is that to say you would like to have this come back to the next board meeting as an action item? Yes. Okay. Um, I would like to address um, some of the things that have said have been said about does, uh, and I realize we're a lot of time, but I just I have to share this. Um, I don't talk about my past life as a high school athlete, but I was one. I, I don't look like it now, but I was one um, volleyball and basketball. And uh, for the girls back then to get used to the gym was quite a struggle. This was in the early days of Title IX. And um, our boys coach, basketball coach, was so protective of that gym floor. We would, you were required to, one, you could not use your gym shoes outside of the gym. And then you were still, we were still washing off our gym shoes before we stepped off onto that gym floor. Because walking onto that gym floor with shoes that maybe have a rock in it, scratches the floor and he wanted that floor pristine um we let our community on those gym floors and they wear all sorts of shoes on those gym floors that do damage our gym floors and we have to upkeep our gym floors to the level that we would want our sports played on those gym floors and the reason we charge is because there is wear and tear. And while you might think what's happening, um, I will go back and I learned a lesson from that very uh, interesting male coach about the care that you need to give to a pristine gym floor. And we were all taught how to clean our shoes so that we did not damage that floor. And our floor stayed beautiful, but we do not require that of our community. We have uh, four of us that would like, or five, that would like to bring this back as action. Do you have any more comments tonight? Just, just one little one for the fun of it. So in measure B, we paid a lot of money to put natural gas, natural grass fields in at our high schools. We were approached before Measure BB by the city and the community groups, as well as our own high school coaches, asking us to put in artificial turf. So the original argument was, well, natural grass is so much better, they told all the reasons. Later, when they wanted artificial turf, it was because they wanted higher utilization rates. And, this, and the, both the city as well as the community groups are coming in saying, yeah, because they can't get access because we'd have to leave them fallow or whatever the word is you use when they're resting to, to recover the grass. So we put that in our bond, BB bond measure. And that was a selling point. And a lot of those folks went out and pushed to have our bond approved because they wanted access to those fields. Okay. And so now we're coming up and saying, okay, well, you have bought these fields. Now we're going to charge you rent on them. And I do believe some rent. I do believe there's natural wear and tear. My comment earlier, just to be sure that it's clear what I was asking for, because it's not what you alluded to, is that if we stopped renting to other people, 
we use our own fields, we use our basketball courts, we use our classrooms, we use our general purpose rooms. How much additional cost is it to rent it out to other people? There is a cost. There will be some additional cost to that. But I don't think it's going to be that large because a large part of our expense are fixed costs that don't change. Um, and so that's part of it. So, you know, I think there's a lot of folks in the community. I think we're going to lose some programs that are valuable. Um, I would not be surprised to see some. Uh, we might want to adopt a program that would solve this problem like the city of Santa Clara has. So Santa Clara does have those fees, but you know what they do? When you, if you've got a project that they believe in, let's take Prairie to Champions. Prairie to Champions, they charge them $66,000 for all the, the public service work that they do for the Prairie to Champions. And guess what? They also give them a, they also give them a grant for $66,000. The cost is zero to the Prairie to Champions. So maybe that's the approach. We leave our rental rates up here and we start subsidizing with grants some of our people. At any rate, I, I think we're making a mistake and I'm, I'm, it looks like I'm about just about the only one here that does that. So thank you very much. I appreciate you listening to me. So just a quick question for Didn't you say at one of our recent meetings of something about Governor Newsom banning artificial turf? No, there, I, what I said was well, uh, there was a bill that was introduced. Um, it got held and never made it to the governor's desk. Uh, but there are, there was a bill that was introduced about the possibility of no longer allowing um, synthetic turf. But it, it didn't make it it didn't make it uh, to the governor's desk in the last uh, legislative cycle. Thank you. We now have five minutes. I want to thank Ms. Healy for her report and for your efforts in including us and in all the information for the last few board meetings. It's been a pleasure to have you at so many, but I realize it's been taxing as well. So thank you. The board has given direction to have this come back as an action item, the next board meeting. And so we will see this at the next board meeting as an action item. If you have any questions between now and then, it was no, we can email Mr. Sheil or Ms. Healy or Dr. Waddell, and hopefully those can be resolved. Um, we now have items from the board. Are there any board members that have any pressing items that they need to share? Jody. Sorry, trust you, Muirhead. Just a quick one to say thank you to Ms. Meltzer for um, showing us around Community Day. We had a really nice um, visit to the school, and it was nice to see the kids and staff there. Okay. And about the holiday that we're celebrating. Happy Thanksgiving. Do I have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Veterans Day. We got, sorry. I am, it is 1130. I was in Bakersfield this morning. <laughs> Um, motion to adjourn again. Veterans Day was very well represented by our two unions. Thank you very much. It was I had made a note, but I'm menu planning in my head. Second, second. And you have nobody online anymore, right? Uh, no, Bonnie's there. Oh. Trustee Canova, Trustee Gonzalez, Trustee Lieberman. Yes. Trustee Muirhead. Yes. Trustee Ratterman. Yes. Trustee Ryan is absent. I vote yes. Student Trustee Valdez. Yes. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned at 1120.